that you're volunteering. <laughs> Recording in progress. Great. So thank you, first and foremost, for being here. Um, second most important thing, snacks in the back are up for grabs for anybody. So if you get uh, need a snack at any point, they're there. There's coffee. Um, there are cold drinks in the refrigerator in the back. So please help yourself. Um, so we want to start by a round of introductions, and then we're going to introduce the process. So um, I'll get started. My name is Alex McIntyre. I'm the assistant unit leader for the Washington Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Um, I facilitated this group for the Northwest Eco Region um, in 2022, and I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so we'll ask everyone to say your name, where you're from, and why it's important for you to be here today. So for me, I really care a lot about public engagement making sure that public voices are heard in decision-making processes. So that's why I'm here and uh, I'm honored to be here. So I'll pass it to Sarah next. We can go around. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Sarah Sells. I'm the assistant unit leader at the Montana Cooperative Wildlife Research Unit in Missoula. And I am excited to be here because I've been involved with these kinds of processes for a long time. I assisted with facilitating last year's uh, Northwestern Montana Ecoregional Committee, too. So, um, yeah, great to be here. Go ahead and... I'm Cody Ensign. I'm from Pillsburg. I've been a guide and an outfitter for 30 years. Um, also done the uh, online monitoring of fish and wildlife parts for eight years now. I'm John McLernan. I'm from Butte. Um, I work over here in Anaconda. Um, and I basically just enjoy both ungulate and lion. Hunting so Just want to make sure we have it for our future. Uh, Trent Sullivan, Boulder. Uh, same as like John, just want to see a healthy uh, population. Uh, Scott Cardio, um, out there on uh, Iron Road Guest Ranch for Deer and Elk Outfitting, and then uh, Montana Mountain Adventures, which is uh, Mountain Outfitting as well as Mountain Conservation um, Organization. Jaco Lisbon, I'm out of Missoula, um, studying outline in the Northern Sapphire for over a decade. Josh Moore, South of Boulder. Uh, and these guys will come and come to the conservation. I'm Josh Pellis here, and I'm out of Boulder as well. I'm 30 year cat hunter, and uh, everything I do at involved I'm in my cat hunting meeting, but um, I'm here also just to. Uh, See what I can do to help the situation as far as that. Matt Lumley Gardner, manage a large ranch, uh, federal trapper, former one of the experience that way. John Barr, I'm from Vicar. I'm, uh, I'm a hunter and I'm a fisherman, so i going to try to be part of, uh, you know, taking this uh, balance of, uh, of our research. Mark Bonaires, Hamilton, Montana. So you care about deer and elk numbers. Plenty. Uh, Steve Fox, uh, Hamilton. I'm just here to learn a little bit of the speech and try to be part of the process. Todd Smansky, Great Falls, Montana. Uh, mainly here for the, hopefully for the preservation of the mountain lions and trying to find a balance between the Big game species, and uh, which I hunt everything uh, in Montana that flies or runs, I'm usually after it. So find the balance. My name is Bill Mitchell. I'm from Missoula. Pretty much like everybody else, I used to run lions, but knees wore out, so that doesn't happen anymore. But I still hunt everything else, and I just want to make sure that everything's taken care of. Thanks everyone for getting us started. We do want to have our folks from FMEP maybe just really quickly say your, your name and your role. I'm um, Brian Whiteley. I'm the game chief from Montana Fish Wildlife Park. I'm Molly Perks. I'm the statewide cardboard coordinator for FMEP. I'm Warren Hansen, wildlife manager of the region of the Jungle. Uh, Jay Colby, I'm a biologist on the region. Sarah Zilke, I'm the wolf management specialist out of Conrad. Hey, I'm Alex Gutter. I'm a population ecologist. Uh, I'm a Just a new uh, region three area biologist. 
Bradley, you have a lot of hands that you as well. I'm an expert on a social science postdoc at the University of Montana. Rebecca Mallory, I'm a region two area biologist in Hamilton. I'm Kelly Crouch, I'm a local area biologist at the University of Montana. I'm Justin Giddy, I'm a biologist at the University of Montana. I'm Justin Giddy, I'm a biologist at the University of Montana. I'm Justin Giddy, I'm a biologist at the University of Montana. I'm Justin Giddy, I'm a biologist at the University of Montana. I'm Justin Giddy, I'm a biologist at the University of Montana. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, <laughs> glad you're here. So, um, we're definitely going to get to know each other much better over the next few days. But, um, what we wanted to do to start is uh, really talk your ears off for a little bit with a number of presentations. And the one we're going to start with, uh, Sarah's going to give, and that's just going to walk you through our process that we'll be undertaking for the next two days. We're gonna get a little bit into the weeds this morning, but don't feel like you need to have this memorized and we'll go back over it. Um, and just, we just wanna orient you to how things are gonna proceed for the next couple of days. Then we'll hear from our folks at FWP about a little bit of the science behind all this. So that, I'll pass it over to Sarah. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Oops, that works. Yeah, All right, so to begin with, um, what we're actually here to do, as you all are aware, is to work through a difficult decision and to make recommendations to decision makers. And so this is all uh, surrounding the mountain lion population objective setting, of course, as we know. And we're going to use the process of structured decision making or SDM. And we'll talk in the next uh, 15 or so minutes about what SDM is. But uh, first, I want to clarify what it is not, which is it's not a debate and it's not conflict resolution. What it is is a logical and deliber deliberative way to make decisions based on our values. So you can think of SDM as a formal application of common sense when you have situations that are too complex for the informal use of common sense. It's a way of thinking. So it formalizes this process of making decisions. We make decisions every single day. And most of the time they're really trivial, small things. We don't need to think much about them, but sometimes we have these bigger uh, decisions we need to make with bigger outcomes. And this is one of those situations where this more formalized decision-making process is super helpful. Another thing about SDM is it's not going to make the decision for us. It will just clarify what we care about and how we can achieve the different objectives for managing a mountain lion population. Uh, it will lead to decisions that are then transparent and explicit and a deliberative process that will um, help us make sure that we fully understand the problem and what we're trying to achieve and how to achieve it. So SDM follows the PROACT cycle where we first start by defining the problem. We then define our objectives or what we really care about. We then think about the different ways we can meet those objectives through different alternatives or actions. We then get into the predictive step of looking at the consequences, so how well each alternative meets each objective. And then we get into the actual decision analytics step of looking at trade-offs and the optimal decision to make. So when we think about a problem, usually the first thing people ask is, what can I do about it? What are my options? <clears throat> but if we don't start with these first two steps of really understanding what the problem is and what we hope to achieve, then we may be solving the wrong problem. Wrong problem. So today you all have a copy of the agenda in front of you, and um, we're going to spend the first part of this morning, about an hour and a half, getting some information from our lovely FWP team here. And then we're going to dive into that first step of the problem framing. And we'll probably spend most of today on that. We might not get further than that today, but that's normal. This first step usually takes quite a bit of time to make sure that we really have clarified what we're here to try to address. So then tomorrow morning, we'll pick back up and we'll begin formulating objectives. And then we will begin what we're calling the zones of acceptability, where those are the different alternatives that we might uh, want to consider for managing the population. So you can think of PROACT in an illustration as well. And you'll see that all the different arrows point across the different steps from problem through the decision taking action. But those arrows that point backwards tells us that this process is also one where we often do return to previous steps because we realize we might have missed something in the earlier uh, part of framing the problem, say, and we can go back and further clarify things by returning to these previous steps. So as we move along, don't feel like if we 
uh, keep going, that we can't go back and address some things if they arise later. So <clears throat> the purpose of the committee is to work with FWP to define a planning strategy where the objective is to manage the West Central Line ecoregional population for population sustainability at a target level that maximizes public satisfaction related to lion hunting opportunity, lion complex, and ungulate population trends. And your charge as this committee is to help us identify a target population trend. So whether that's to increase the population, decrease it, or maintain a stable population. Once we identify which direction you want to go, we're going to then try to pinpoint the degree of change if we don't want a stable population, whether that's to increase or decrease it by how much the percentage. And then we're going to talk about potential emphases on different line management units. So we could think about things like older age class harvest opportunities or conflict reduction, um, how to help ungulate populations, perhaps where they're struggling, and opportunity, and so on. So that will be something that we'll spend some time also identifying where we can put these different emphases in place. But we want to make sure that we steer clear of the things we're not charged with, which is setting or thinking about season structure. The different license types and different allocation of quotas among LMUs. So we'll remind ourselves of these uh, charges and the things we're not going to talk about uh, throughout this process, but that's to, good to keep in mind as we go through all this. <clears throat> so thinking about the PROAC cycle, when we know that there's a decision to be made, something has to happen, but what? <clears throat> so to illustrate this, um, this first step of defining the problem, this again is that key first step to really understand what we're here to achieve. And it often is something that we think will be a simple step, but it's usually uh, something that is pretty difficult and can be frustrating. Once we all start talking about this, we'll realize that everyone has usually a little bit of a different understanding of the problem at hand. And so really getting down into those weeds of what the problem is will help everyone have that shared understanding. If we don't spend time on this, we can end up solving the wrong problem, which would be a not great thing to do. We could use the wrong tools and information to address the problem. And in the worst case, we could put a lot of investment in the wrong solution. So that's why we'll spend a good amount of time on this first step. We like this uh, simple example of buying a house just to illustrate this process for you. So for this family that's thinking about a house, uh, this is their problem statement. It's a house is too small for their family, and they have a small yard for the kids to play in. They could add on to their current house and live with that small yard, or they might purchase a larger house, but either option would be costly, of course. They live in the city, so commute times to work are short, but schools in the suburbs can be better, and we can afford to increase their monthly mortgage payments, but need to stay within budget, of course. So that captures the different elements that this family might be thinking about. <clears throat> Moving on to the step for objectives. This is where we get to talk about what we really care about. So if we could solve the problem perfectly, what would we accomplish? When we think about objectives, we want to think about where we want to end up. So what is the bottom line? And again, what is it that we really care about? For this home buying example, we might have these six objectives where the house should be large enough, the yard should be big enough as well for the kids, Schools should be high quality, neighborhoods should be family friendly, commute time should be reasonable, and costs should be minimized. So then we're ready to dive into the step everyone wants to start with, with alternatives. Again, um, if we don't really start with this problem of definition and the objectives, then we can't really figure out what our alternatives should be. And so these are different things we could do to meet our objectives. There are options and solutions and management actions. <clears throat> As we get to this step, we'll need to make sure that everything that we consider is financially, legally, and politically reasonable. And so for this house example, the family might do nothing. They just live with what they have. They could renovate their current house, and they could consider maybe these three other homes on Eaton, Wade, or West uh, Street and Boulevards. All right, so on to the consequences step. This is where we get a little bit more technical. We need to predict the outcome of each objective under each alternative. So this is where we use data and professional judgment to say, how does this alternative meet objectives? And this is usually a difficult step because this kind of prediction is difficult to do. <clears throat> so with this house example, we can organize everything into a consequence table. You see, you have the different objectives there by row and the alternatives arranged by column. 
And so this can really put everything in one table, right, where you can more easily see the different uh, elements of this decision. <clears throat> From here, the first thing we can recognize, perhaps, is that Eaton Street is uh, one of the ones that's actually not doing great compared to the other different alternatives because it has the same number of bedrooms as other homes, as a couple other homes, but it is smaller than some of the others. The schools are only fair. The neighborhood is poor. It's a long commute time and it's the most expensive option. So here we can immediately see that we can eliminate that um, alternative from our consideration because it's outperformed by all the other alternatives that we're considering. <clears throat> Once we do that, we can also focus in on, say, this objective for short commute time. It only varies by five minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 or 15. And so maybe at that point, this isn't really that important as an objective. It was important, but the alternatives we're considering all have about equal performance. So we can also eliminate that one from this table. And that simplifies things a little bit. <clears throat> so then once we have gone through those consequence predictions, we need to look at the trade-offs and optimization step where we evaluate how the alternatives are meeting those different objectives. <clears throat> and this is where we're going to be able to really help the decision maker understand the proposal you put forward for mountain lines because it will put everything in the most transparent and explicit uh, context possible. So in this example, we can put numbers to the previous table where we took the which home was large enough, we said the biggest one gets a score of one and the smallest home gets a score of three. And you can see that we did that for each of the different objectives there. And this makes it a little bit easier to compare everything now. We're not comparing apples to oranges, but apples across. We like everything with ones and we uh, know that those with threes are not doing as well. So then one thing we could do is sum up these scores and we can see then that if uh, we look at the Wade Street, it had the highest score, but say we have minimizing costs is actually a really high priority and we can see that it had a three. So maybe that Wade Street alternative isn't really one we want to go with. Again, this is not making the decision, it's just clarifying it. Possibly we decide to renovate instead, it gets a good score as well. <clears throat> but again, maybe these other things are important and you'd be willing to pay a little bit more and cost to achieve the other objectives on that table. And so again, we're not making a decision with a table like this, we're just clarifying it. And so at that point, once we have gone through all these steps, we'll be ready to decide and take action. And for this family, a simple example, maybe White Street is what they go with. So um, just ground rules for this process. We ask you to honor the process and uh, walk through each step with us. It, Again, it might seem frustrating at times, but we have a good intention here. We ask everyone to have mutual respect and to also avoid filibustering. So we'll stop you if you, we have really long um, topics that we're talking about sometimes. Don't feel offended. We're just trying to keep the process moving. Um, so we're going to really try to stay on course then. And so again, minimizing stories and respecting the breaks that we've built in and stay within the charges of the committee. And again, as I said, we'll remind you of these often, so we'll stay within that top card and avoid those other topics. And so uh, that's all I have for, for this. Um, and I think next up, we are ready to dive into our information session. But before we do that, any questions about what you just saw? Okay. Thank you, sir. This is the first time you decided to get out. Okay. You don't have time, right? No problem. Okay. <laughs> All you get is me. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll be entertaining enough. Um, I just wanted to cover a few things before we got started, kind of put all this stuff in context, and maybe um, we'll talk a little bit about an elephant in the room. Um, you know, I think probably just about everybody in the room is somewhat familiar with our commission. And in uh, trying to work with our commission, many of you probably uh, spoke to the commission at commission meetings or outside of the commission. Um, in my role as the game bureau chief, I get to spend a fair bit of time standing in front of them and trying to share uh, the department's recommendations. <clears throat> and, you know, we did this 
This Lion Eaton Regional Population Objective Committee wants already, we did it two years ago with the Northwest uh, Eagle Region, and it was based on a conservation strategy that the commission at the time adopted in 2019. So this isn't a brand new idea, it isn't a brand new process, it's something we've been working on. And we took the commission or the strategy in 2019 to the commission. Um, they endorsed it, adopted it, um, went through the line of equal regional population objective committee uh, with the northwestern portion of the state, came up with some recommendations. Uh, we then took those recommendations to the commission the first year and the commission adopted those and we were kind of moving along. Um, <clears throat> back in June, the commission kind of changed direction on us. And it kind of threw a lot of people, um, I don't know, for a ball, I guess. Um, and so my sense is that for most people in public that deal with the commission, there's a great deal of frustration that goes along with the interactions that they have. Um, and also offer that as a, um, a member of FWP, there is a distinct difference between us and the commission and there is a great deal of frustration at times when we're working with the commission. I've had the opportunity to work with two other states and now Montana. This is the, the third set of commissioners that I've had the ability to work with or the opportunity to work with. And having spoken with a lot of those commissioners, they're often quite frustrated with the process as well. They have some real challenges uh, for one, they're volunteering their time. They get some travel expenses to, to kind of cover their time. Um, but, you know, it's not a, a well-paying position. It's, it's not a lofty thing. Very few people seem to go there and move on to greater things. It's, a, it's something they volunteer. It's a public service that they do. They are bound by regulations and statutes that deal with open meeting law. In other words, they can't figure out what they're trying to do ahead of time and then stand there in front of the public and make a smooth uh, decision. They often, you know, they're struggling with the same things we are trying to figure out how the heck it is they can get something that's going to be in the best interests of all the public and move something forward. And so they don't get to discuss the information behind the scenes with a, with a majority of the commission. They have to do it out in the public. It's messy. It's designed to be messy. And then they've got a lot of constituents who are trying to share their thoughts with them at the same time. And so they have to limit them, the amount of time that someone gets to speak to two minutes, sometimes just a minute, because there's so many people want to share that idea. Um, and rarely does anybody get up at the end of the, of the meeting at the call of the public and just say, hey, thank you. You know, it, it's a it's a thankless job and it's frustrating for them. It's frustrating for us. It's frustrating for you. So um, we're we're doing the best we can to try to come up with ways to capture um, all the variety of different human dimensions uh, aspects of this. And so there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, we can ask people to um, send in comments. And then if it's something like lions or if it's something like wolves, sometimes there'll be, you know, we have a wolf one, uh, about two years ago, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 26,000 comments that came in. We share that with the commission. It's really difficult for them to get through that much information uh, prior to a meeting. Um, we can conduct surveys. And when we conduct a survey, you know, that's a really balanced way to get e information um, you can gauge uh, what proportion of the public feels different ways. Uh, you can type, tailor your questions to a particular segment of the public, um, and you can get really good input, but it's not a really good way for people to share their, their really, you know, a lot of deep thought in there. And then there's techniques like this that allow us to really explore uh, some of these things as well, and trying to get more deeply into you know, why it is and where we're trying to go. So as we were looking for membership on this group, uh, we had a number of people that <clears throat> um, had commented, you know, well, 
Commission's already decided what they're going to do. Why the heck should I waste my time even volunteering for this? Um, and what I'd say is, I think it's really important, and I think it says a lot about the people in the room that they still felt committed to be part of this, because it's important to us as an agency to be able to get this information. And in the in the process of doing that, there's nothing that binds the agency to, to move forward with the recommendations that come forward from this group. We're not obligated to do it. We, we're gonna to put together a report at the end of this and it, it'll be posted online, it'll be forever. And if you wanna go, you know, the Northwest Eco Region report is still up there. It's still available for everybody to see. And we'll do the same with this. But, the department is pretty well committed to this. I had a conversation with our director um, specifically about that topic and whether or not we should even move forward with this. And he was committed to it. Dustin Temple was committed. He said, it's still something that's important. It's still something we want to do. And so it's important. Once we provide a recommendation to the commission, again, the commission is not bound by our recommendation. They can choose to go anywhere they want. They have to consider a lot of things. A lot of people say, gosh, you know, biology should drive everything. There shouldn't be any social aspect of that. Well, probably the simplest example I can give, um, a guy named Rick Kahn who worked for Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, 15 years ago, he was talking about buck-to-go ratios. And he says, our biological sideboards are far, are far broader than our social sideboards. We always say, you know, biology should drive it. But if you've got a buck to doe ratio of 10 to 100, or if you've got a buck to doe ratio of 40 to 100, reproduction isn't affected. Biologically, that's the same. But socially, those are vastly different outcomes, vastly different things. And so there's a lot of interest in that. And so that's where, you know, we, we, we hire wildlife managers. We just about every biologist in the room has a degree in wildlife management somewhere. Um, but wildlife management is really the interface between biology and sociology. And what is it we're trying to attain? What is it we're trying to get to? So today we're going to end over the next four days of this, this exercise. Um, <clears throat> when you talk to us, we'll definitely share with you what we know. Uh, we'll share with you why we believe we know it. And we'll also share with you what we don't know. Um, thing that we talk about statistically, we often refer to as confidence. Um, a lot of times what I talk about is certainty. You know, how certain are we that we we know this? How, you know, a lot of times I talk about, you know, trying to forecast into the future is a lot like being on the shooting range. You know, if you're in the field away from the shooting range, you know, you might be able to get a two inch group at hundred yards. You move out to 200, you hope that that stays to about four inches. But the further you get into the future, there's a lot of other things that, that mess with you, the wind, rain. And so a two inch group at 100 yards may not convert to a four inch group at 200 yards. But the closer we get to that, the more precise and the more certain we become in the outcome. And so we put out that request for help. We wanted uh, volunteers to participate on this. And what we wanted and what we looked for are people that are familiar with different aspects of lions and the effects lions have and the values that people place on lions. But what we really look for in the individuals that participate is that not only are they experienced and do they have interests in it, but they're also independent thinkers and that they're willing to step away from, you know, gosh, I don't want whatever group I'm a member of. We don't, we don't really, uh, we certainly care about it, but in this exercise, we don't want the input of the group. What we want is your input. That's the expertise that you bring to this room, the experience you bring to the room. And so we want to hear your independent thoughts and your ability to, to think about it and uh, talk about what we're going for. We will be sharing this with the commission. I have no guarantees about where they're going to go with it, um, but we also don't have any problem coming back to the commission with the same recommendation in subsequent years if they didn't agree with our 
our recommendation last year. If it's the right thing to do, we'll bring it back. So that's all I wanted to do to kind of kick this off. I'll certainly be willing to answer any questions if anybody has any. All right, well, if not, we'll uh, move to more of the, uh, the information that we've collected online. And uh, I think Kelly, I think you're up. What's up? Thank you, Brian. Kelly Coppett is going to talk to us about integrated health line management. <laughs> okay, thanks. So I'm going to be talking about integrated chiromorphic management, uh, the case in the beach of West Central Montana. So, um, leading up to about 2010, there are fairly widespread declines in ungulate populations across administrative region two, so West Central Montana. And those raised a lot of concerns from both the public, from hunters, as well as agency staff about what might be happening to the ungulate populations. And so, at that time, our wildlife managers are under obvious pressure to respond and implement some type of, um, to break some type of recommendation about how to reverse these ungulate declines. But the challenge is um, knowing what the, what the right decisions are and the most appropriate management recommendations can be really challenging because there's a whole variety of factors that influence ungulate populations. And so we have top-down factors such as predation from multiple large carnivores, as well as bottom-up factors, including habitat, severe weather events, land use changes. Um, and so knowing what to do in each situation um, can be really challenging for wildlife managers. Um, so what the agency did um, starting in 2010 was implement three years of baseline elk monitoring um, to try and understand what was limiting um, elk populations. And, and we, we work in the Southern Bitterroot Valley. Um, and the result of that three years of baseline elk monitoring was we found strong evidence that the elk populations in the Southern Bitterroot were limited by predation and primarily by predation from mountain lions. So in response um, to that information and continuing declines in ungulate populations, um, the commission implemented an integrated carnivore ungulate management program. Um, and so what integrated carnivore ungulate management is, it's a combination of liberalized carnivore and restrictive ungulate harvest regulations. Um, and so that program is designed to produce short-term increases in the ungulate population while at the same time ensuring long-term conservation of the carnivore populations. And so what the commission approved and implemented was restrictive elk harvest regulations, both bull and cow harvest regulations in 2010 and 2011. Um, and then starting in 2012, there was a combination of liberalized wolf, um, black bear and mountain lion harvest regulations. And so what I'm gonna be talking about today is a research project um, that we implemented to evaluate the efficacy of this management program and to try and inform future carnivore ungulate management here in Montana. So um, the objectives of the project were to evaluate the effects of this integrated carnivore ungulate management on both mountain lion and elk populations. 
And so we had two primary questions. Um, first, did the changes in the mountain lion harvest regulation result in changes in mountain lion population abundance? And if so, did those changes in mountain lion population abundance result in any changes in elk calf recruitment or elk population dynamics? And so the figure here is showing the study areas that we worked in. Um, and so that is administrative region two. The red grid is the Southern Bitterroot study area. Um, and that's located in Ravalli County and includes Hunt District 250, the West Fork of the Bitterroot and Hunt District 270, the East Fork of the Bitterroot. Um, this was an area that was managed for mountain lion population reduction. Um, and there's two elk populations in that area that we also worked on. Um, the blue grid is the Upper Clark Fork study area, and that's located in Granite County. Um, and that, that study area expands uh, multiple hunt districts. Um, that was an area that was managed for stable mountain lion populations. Um, and there's two primary elk populations that we focused on in that area. So our first question, did changes in mountain lion harvest regulations result in changes in mountain lion population abundance? To address that, we used the before after control treatment design. And so what we did um, in the Bitterroot area, so that was our treatment area, we estimated um, mountain lion population abundance on December 1st, 2012, which was immediately before the liberalized mountain lion harvest regulations were implemented. And then we waited four years and we came back and we estimated mountain lion abundance a second time to see um, if abundance had changed and if so how. Um, in the control area, the upper Clark Fork area, we also estimated mountain lion populations there in 2013 and again four years later in 2017. So the big challenge um, that we had at this point is we knew what we wanted to learn, but we didn't um, have a good way to estimate mountain lion population abundance that was short term enough that we could um, get a good estimate and then come back a few years later and get another good estimate um, and be able to understand how populations changed. So we can't just count mountain lions the same way we count deer and elk. Um, and so with elusive species like a mountain lion, um, we can't assume that we're going to have 100% detection probability or really anything close to 100%. Um, so in these types of situations, um, a standard way to handle that is to implement some type of capture recapture approach. Um, and those methods um, are relatively simple alternative um, when counts are not possible. And so just to talk through um, briefly how this works. So this is a simple example of how a capture recapture um, project would occur. So imagine your yellow circle there, um, that would be your first capture effort. You would go out, imagine you capture 25 mountain lions, you give them all some type of mark, um, and you release them. You wait, you give the population time to mix and mingle across the range, and then you come back for a second capture effort, which would be your blue circle there. In that second capture effort, imagine you've captured 20 mountain lions, and five of those were previously marked. Um, so what we can do then is we use the proportion of the mark to the unmarked lions to estimate the total. And so in this case, um, in our capture event two, five of our 20 mountain lions are marked. And so that has to be proportional to our original 25 marks um, deployed, divided by N. And when you solve the equation, you get an estimate of approximately 100 mountain lions. So the basic principle here, and Alex and Melissa are going to talk more about how this works, but the basic principle is that you can learn about animal abundance um, by the proportion of marked animals that you recapture in repeated capture events. For mountain lions, it, it's a little bit more complicated. And so we made a jump to a spatial capture recapture model. And all that means, um, a spatially explicit capture recapture model, just means that we use the location of the capture information um, in our model. And we do that to account for a couple of things. And, First, with our mountain lion capture recapture effort, we did not have uniform intensity um, of search effort across the study area. So we have a big study area. Some areas are not accessible due to snowpack or um, ownership access, those types of things. Um, so we need to account for the fact that our search effort is not uniform across space. Um, also, for a species like a mountain lion that might be occupying more of a home range and just randomly walking around the study area, um, we know that the 
probability of capturing a mountain lion a long distance from where it was first captured is going to be less than if you return to somewhere else nearby within that animal's range, your probability of capturing the individual is going to be higher. So we need to account for those types of spatial patterns in the landscape um, when we're trying to estimate our capture probability. Um, the last thing here is that we can also assume that mountain lions are going to be most abundant in higher quality mountain lion habitat. So the habitat within the study area um, and within the hunt districts where we're working, it's not going to be uniform during the winter across space when we're working. So how did we estimate mountain lion population abundance? If you look at the um, figure on the left side there, um, what you can see, that's an example of the Bitterroot study grid. So those black lines is a five kilometer by five kilometer um, sampling grid. The background is the green to red. So that's a representation of habitat quality. So the green is going to be the poorest quality wintering mountain lion habitat. Those are primarily high elevation areas. Um, the red and the yellow are going to be higher quality uh, mountain lion habitat. And then what you can see there, the purple lines, so that is our search effort. So that's where people went to look for animals. So we're not going to be making inference about what lions exist in places that we didn't search. Um, and so that search effort there, there's purple lines um, across the two study areas in two years. Um, search effort was anywhere from about 8,000 kilometers to 20,000 kilometers. And that search effort was con concentrated December, January, February. So that's how we searched for mountain lions. Um, when an animal was encountered, the handlers released their dog, they treed the animal. And then rather than drug the animal and pull it out of the tree and give it a neck band or an ear tag or a permanent mark, um, we used a biopsy dart to collect a DNA sample. Um, and so the, the picture of Cody here on the right, um, that's a biopsy dart with a little um, meat and hair sample at the end. Based on that, we can get the individual identity of a mountain lion based on its unique DNA signature. So that's our DNA-based capture-recapture approach. So when we went out and we estimated the mountain lion population abundance in the two study areas before and after the mountain lion management treatment was implemented, um, what we found, um, so the estimated population abundance is going to be on the vertical axis and our study area in years is going to be on our x-axis here. And so what you can see is that the predicted abundance in the Bitterroot study area uh, in 2016, so four years after the management treatment, um, was lower than before the treatment was implemented. Um, in contrast, in the Clark Fork study area, you see approximately um, stable population sizes in 2013 and 2017. And so this provides us with evidence that there was a relationship between the liberalized mountain lion um, harvest regulations and the abundance of mountain lions on the landscape four years later. Um, we also get information from the DNA. We can tell if the animal is male or female. And so when we look at that information, we see that the um, reduction in mountain lion abundance in the bitter treatment area was primarily related to re reduction of male animals. We had about the same number of females um, estimated in both 2012 and 2016, but the real reduction came in the male segment of the population. Um, in contrast, in the Clark Fork area, we see um, roughly equal sex ratio between the two time periods. So using our um, model, we can then make predictions um, to how that uh, abundance of animals is distributed across the landscape. And then we can compare how they were distributed across the study area in 2012 and 2016. And so what the figure here is showing you, um, this is the same bitter study area. Um, the red and the yellow are places that were predicted to have an increase in mountain lion population abundance between 2012 and 2016. And the areas um, turquoise and dark blue are predicted to have the strongest decreases in mountain lion abundance across time. And so over the whole study area, we estimated on average, um, we predicted a 26% decrease in the mountain lion population abundance between 2012 and 2016. 
But when we look at how that's distributed across the two different hunt districts in the area, we can see um, we predicted a 22% decrease in the East Fork of the Bitterroot Hunt District 270 and a 39% reduction in abundance in Hunt District 250, the West Fork of the Bitterroot. And so one of the nice things about um, incorporating space into this type of model is then you can partition um, your estimated abundance across space, and then you can drop your hunt district boundaries or other, other things on top of that to make decisions at a scale um, that it might be smaller than your study area. So what can we conclude about the mountain lion population responses to those mountain lion regulations? Um, well, we see evidence that the abundance in the treatment area was lower four years after the treatment. Um, in 2016, so four years after those harvest regulations were in place, um, we estimated an abundance of 3.6 mountain lions per 100 square kilometers in the west fork of the Bitterroot and four mountain lions per 100 square kilometers in the east fork of the Bitterroot. And so the goal of reducing the mountain lion population by 30%. Um, that was the target. Um, largely, we see that those population management goals were achieved by the harvest management regulations. Um, mountain lion abundance in the uh, control area was similar between 2013 and 2017. In 2017, we estimated um, an abundance of 2.1 mountain lions per 100 square kilometers. Um, and so the management objective of having a stable mountain lion population in that watershed was also achieved. And then I just want to point out that um, the post-treatment densities in the treatment area in the Bitterroot, um, they were still at the higher end of estimated mountain lion population abundances from all the other states. So 3.6 and 4.0 mountain lions per 100 square kilometers is still a healthy population of mountain lions on the landscape. And so largely the long-term goal of conserving mountain lion populations was also achieved. So the second question, did changes in mountain lion population abundance result in changes in elk calf recruitment or elk population growth? Um, to address that question, if you look at um, the figure on the right, so again, this is our study area. You can see the two red, District 250 and 270. Those are our two elk populations that occupy the treatment area. And then District 210 and 216 um, in Granite County, those are our two elk populations that occupied the control area. So what we did was we developed an integrated elk population model um, to evaluate um, if there were changes in elk calf recruitment or elk population growth rate, comparing the five years before 2012 to the five years after 2012. So um, we used survey data um, and that included elk count information, um, as well as age ratio data collected from elk counts together with elk harvest information um, to construct an elk population model. And then in our population model, we were able to also account for annual weather and growing season conditions, other things out there that might be impacting um, how that elk, the elk populations and calf recruitment are changing through time. Um, so we use this model to estimate the recruitment rate and the population growth rate, and then we compared between the two time periods. And what we found, um, so the vertical axis here is the predicted elk calf recruitment rate, and then the um, horizontal axis is the um, four different elk populations. And so on the left hand side, districts 210 and 216 are control populations. We predict roughly equal elk calf recruitment rates um, during the five years pre-treatment and the five years post-treatment. Um, the two populations here on the right-hand side, District 250 and 270, um, we do see evidence for increases in elk calf recruitment during the five years post-treatment, and that's particularly strong in District 250. Um, so District 250 was the place that we predicted a 39% reduction in mountain lion population. And that's where we see the strongest predicted increase in calf recruitment rate. Um, in District 270, we see some evidence for an increase in calf recruitment rate, and that was associated with a predicted 22% decline in mountain lion populations. So one thing to point out here, these are the actual observed, the predicted um, recruitment rate. And so it's important here to consider that um, 
This is what we estimated given the actual annual winter and growing season conditions. So was this weather, was this real? We're able to then, um, using our model, make some predictions about recruitment rate in the two areas by holding um, all of our covariates at their average conditions. So during the 11 years that we did this, we took the average winter severity, the average spring precipitation, all the average conditions that an elk might experience, and we developed these predictions, um, and they largely confirm um, what's in the, the previous figure, and that is um, in the Bitterroot study area, the treatment area, we see strong evidence for an increase in um, elk calf recruitment in the five years post-treatment. But what we can see here um, is that that predicted increase in calf recruitment, it was the strongest in 2013, and then it kind of waned over time. So immediately following treatment, we see the strongest change in the elk population. And then over the five years, um, we still see some evidence for changes in calf recruitment, but that effect starts to wane. Um, in the control area, we see roughly co uh, consistent recruitment, calf recruitment over time. So what can we conclude about the effects of harvest management? Um, carnival harvest management, it may be an effective tool for increasing ungulate recruitment. So in this particular study system, what we found is that um, a two-year estimated 17 and 12% mountain lion population harvest rate resulted in a predicted 26% reduction in the population. And that didn't achieve a short-term increase in all calf recruitment population growth rate. Um, with those increases um, in calf recruitment being greatest immediately post-treatment and then declining over time. And so while we do see evidence that these prescribed harvest regulations achieve both the carnivore and the ungulate population management goals, um, it's important to, to use caution in generalizing these results to other systems. And I say that because, like I mentioned in the beginning, there's a whole variety of different factors that influence ungulate populations, and the relative influence of all of those factors is going to vary across space. Um, so the specific carnivore harvest rates um, that we documented here, they may or may not correspond to these specific ungulate vital rates in other systems. Um, and that's because predator-prey relationships are complex and they vary across space and they can vary pretty widely across space. And so before I end, I just, I wanna acknowledge um, this work, it was an effort by a whole variety of agency staff as well as students and professors at the University of Montana and Montana State University. Um, and I, I wanna acknowledge the folks in the Bitterroot Valley that supported this work and then all of our field crew and hound handlers that, that made the work possible and worked with us to figure out how to do this and how to do it well. So that's all I have if anybody has questions. Would you suspect a similar outcome if it was mill deer instead of elk? Or... Um, not necessarily. <laughs> Josh? It looked like um, after five years post treatment, you were back to similar recruitment levels. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the factors were? Was it that the carnivores increased back to previous levels, or was it other factors like malnourishment or something else? Um, I, I don't know that there was any big changes in the habitat during those five years. There were a few fires, but there was nothing um, in terms of major land use changes or other things that would make me suspect it was changes in the nutritional landscape. I, I noticed in there that uh, uh, how elk harvest went down. Mm -hmm. After a few like two thousand fish, it went down and and pretty much leveled off. And did you guys consider the factor that the lack of harvesting cow elk may have enhanced the recruitment as well, cap recruitment? Um, the way that we estimated cap recruitment um, should have factored in. Um, that in the early years when there is heavier removal of the females that could have skewed the ratio. We did account for that. 
um, when we estimated the recruitment rate. Um, and then during the five years post treatment, there was very limited um, cattle harvest. So, and kind of along with that, the number of, of tags issued remained the same during that time, as well as far as our um, opportunities, you know, whether these special tag or not, or units were over there. Are you so, talking about for elk? Or? Yeah, so more cow tags issued or increasing tags or anything like that. Um, hmm. There's largely decreasing okay. um, cows, especially in um, 250 and somewhat in 250. So they're, they're decreasing cow population, kind of corresponding with the number of. Tags are being issued as well. Yes, okay. and, and that started about 2010, and then uh, 2011 as well. What was the bear harvest during that five-year period? Did that go up or down? It was roughly stable. So the the black bear, there was a regulation change to extend the black bear season, and that. When you look at the black bear harvest, it seems to vary annually a lot more so than in a consistent way associated with the changes in black bear harvest. Do you DNA all the harvested cats from those areas as well and then incorporate yep. that data into your model then? We did, yeah. So we collected um, from harvested animals on the Idaho side as well as the Montana side and all the districts surrounding our study areas. One question. Yeah. Um, I noticed in the bitter um, cat from, from 12 to 16 females paid pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Is that a concern for you with uh, new recruitment as far as leaving the female uh, basically intact? That's going to, your, 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 your uh, population is going to go right back where it was yesterday if you don't. Address that, right? Yeah, so I, I think that's an important reason to point out um, that the abundance may have changed, but what is the sex ratio? Um, just from a long term population management standpoint, as you're pointing out, um, maintaining the same amount of females um, is probably going to re result in the population going back um, if that treatment was removed. Um. Guys, quick question here. Uh, did they get, um, is there a current update health management plan with new um, objective numbers? It, when's the last time health objective numbers? Is that finished? That's or? a question for Rebecca. Okay. Do you want to answer? Yeah, we're, we're still in that process of uh, redoing, um, updating the health management plan. So we've already got comments here on that. We're closed and we're um, revising our. Our recommendations for that. So I'm actually in the design line. We're at Brian. Yeah, what's the design line on the health management plan? It's, uh, we don't have a precise timeline. Um, we have to uh, take the time to respond to all the comments that came in on the plan and on the EA. Um, <clears throat> once that's finalized, um, then uh, the agency will have to issue a uh, decision notice on it and then it'll be finalized. We're probably looking at, you know, two to three months. But, but we didn't recommend a uh, change, a uh, decrease in the objective for the last work for you to be. All right, thank you. Scully. Yeah. Uh, Alyssa and Alex are going to come talk to us next. Oh, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> okay. 
that we've been doing and, and some, some similar stuff to Kelly, the monitoring for uh, strategy plan. So um, throughout much of the 1900s, you know, historic primal persecution and dwindled game numbers have led to really low numbers of lions across much of the state. Um, lions are, of course, now a success story and um, species is once again thriving as a managed game species. Um, so, uh, you know, managed uh, successful carnivore species, you know, of course, those create some challenges for management due to its controversial nature. Um, and so these challenges led FWP to identify a need to improve methods for estimating lions on the population to improve uh, informed management. So that is what led to the writing of the Mountain Lion Monitoring and Management Strategy that was published in 2019. And this document kind of laid the groundwork for our new method of how we're monitoring lions across the state. One of the sort of critical pieces of that strategy is a resource selection function model. So we're going to talk about this a lot today. This is what we're going to call an RSF. And this is basically a model that predicts uh, lion quality, lion habitat quality, particularly in wintertime across the whole state. So this model was built using data locations from collared mountain lions. Those are those red dots, those locations. And validating using uh, harvest locations. Those are the blue dots. And then also kind of created in conjecture with habitat environmental variables that uh, previous studies in Montana had found to be important to predicting lion habitat. So, you know, things like elevation and canopy cover, slope aspect, and some other different variables. So this is what that RSF habitat model looks like for the state. So those areas that are blue, those lowest values are lowest predicted habitat quality for lions. The red areas are the highest predicted quality habitat for lions. So the uh, 2019 strategy then kind of broke up the state into these four different ecoregions, and these aren't based on administrative boundaries, but they're um, sort of you know large areas with broadly similar uh, habitat quality and sort of contiguous habitat quality. Um, and these areas are large on purpose. Uh, it's important to have a large area in order to be able to mitigate the you know influence of immigration and emigration on lion populations and on management and monitoring because lions are such large ranging mobile species. So we're mostly going to be just talking about the three westernmost ecoregions. We're not doing management or monitoring, excuse me, in the eastern ecoregion. Uh, so we'll just be focusing on the three uh, western regions for this study. And uh, Alex is going to give you a little rundown on our, our uh, statistical. So um, this is going to be a review. So Kelly kind of went over it, but it's important. So we're going to go over it again. So most of our data is based off of capture mercury capture theory for wildlife. So essentially, if we go out, we capture as many individuals as we can, and we mark them in some way. So we can tell an individual from another individual. And then we let them go so they can re enter the population. And we go back out and we do it again. And usually, how it works out is when you go back out, you get some of the individuals for a second time. And so, these are the recaptures. And this is really the key part of where this data comes from because it's all probabilities, like Kelly said. And so, the larger the population, the less likely you are to get individuals multiple times because if you're just randomly grabbing somebody, you have less chance of randomly grabbing the same individual multiple times. Um, this is probabilities. I feel like the classic example is cards. If you have five cards and you randomly pick one, put it back, and you do that four times, you're probably going to get the same card twice. But if you have a whole deck and you just grab a random card five times, you're probably not going to get a reach. So we learn about abundance based off of how many individuals we sample multiple times. And we can do this infinitely number of times if we want to. 
But that's not all of the information we get when we go out there. So this spatially explicit capture recapture model is what we use because we have additional information and so we want to incorporate that to make the best estimate we can with our available data. So we have this encounter history information, which is the capture mark recapture, who are we capturing, how many times are we capturing them. But we also know where we're capturing them. So that incorporates where they're living. So this is kind of like you're going to expect to see your neighbor walking their dog because they live next to you, so you're likely to bump into them. But if you see them two towns over, you're going to be like, why are you here? <laughs> so this incorporates activity center. So where is the lion kind of centering their movements around? And if we're expecting to find more lions or something that have been in that high quality habitat than in that low quality habitat. So we can get density is linked to habitat quality. And then we're also incorporating how many times we're capturing people. And then we have that detection because we're more likely to encounter them if we're sampling by where they're living. So we're incorporating all three of these pieces instead of just the capture mercury capture probabilities to give us a stronger estimate of what's going on with that population. And once we have all of this, we are linking that lion density to habitat quality because that's one of the steps of that model. And so we have our survey areas where we're linking density to habitat quality, and we can apply that relationship outside of the areas we survey to the rest of the ecoregion to get an estimate for what's going on in the rest of the area. And so this is the extrapolating abundance across the ecoregion. So we're basically applying what we learned in our survey areas to the rest of the ecoregion to get an estimate of what's going on in the places we did not sample. And with that. Um, so each of our three ecoregions um, has a trend monitoring area. And these are study areas, basically, that we're going to go back to again and again and kind of resample and re-monitor our populations. Each ecoregion also has a supplemental um, study area. And these we have more flexibility here in how we monitor. So these areas, you know, we might go back to and survey again. We might change up and go to a different area. This is kind of where there's more flexibility in strategy. Um, so since the implementation of the line monitoring and management strategy in 2019, we started doing our monitoring work up in the Northwest Eagle region, monitored in the trend monitoring area in Libby, um, then moved down the next winter to a uh, supplemental monitoring area on the I-90 corridor, and then of course we did the Northwest Leapock. We then moved down to monitoring in the West Central Eagle region in the winter of 2022 in Lincoln area. Last winter, we were in the supplemental monitoring area uh, in Little Belt. And here we are doing the West Central Epoch. Next winter, we're going to move down to the Southwest Eco Region to monitor the trend monitoring area in Paradise Valley and Gallatin Canyon area. We'll then move to a supplemental monitoring area that's yet to be defined. And then we'll do the Southwest Epoch. And then the winter of 2026, we'll go back up to uh, the Libby monitoring area and survey that again. And that's how we'll be able to see you know, how has harvest in the past six years impacted the population since we last monitored. So all of this is still kind of part of what we call an adaptive harvest management. Um, and this is, again, sort of part of that cycle we go through. Um, part of that is where we're at right now is when we're engaging stakeholders, that's you guys, and it's your job. It's we're focusing on today and tomorrow primarily to um, develop a population objectives. So these are things, you know, different objectives that we might have for the population. Uh, these are going to be specific, achievable, measurable, and time-specific objectives. And this is what we're focusing on right now. After this meeting this week, um, the FUP science team will get together and they will identify different harvest alternatives that could be used to meet those different objectives. And so that is going to be done with the integrated population model. Um, and we'll you know, probably talk about that more at the next meeting, but that's a way that we can sort of um, predict how harvest might impact our populations over time. And that's a model that will take into account the data we're talking about today, but it also it's integrated and is able to incorporate lots of different kinds of data. So it also incorporates all the harvest data, sex ratio, and age class harvest environments. And then we're going to get back together in October, and it'll be your job then to evaluate all those different objectives, or excuse me, all those different alternatives, and find one that you can all agree on, which will then go to the Fish and Wildlife Commission next spring, which is, as Brian talked about, kind of where the decision is ultimately made. Um, We'll then move into our implementation period where harvest is implemented. And then eventually we'll come back and resurvey um, those trend monitoring areas to evaluate 
how harvest impacted our populations and how we might adapt from there if need be. So that's the big cycle. Um, I'm just now going to kind of give you more details on how we actually do our monitoring. Uh, so this is, first of all, we the crews that we actually have on the ground gathering all of our data are contractors who are um, trained houndsmen and housewomen and, and their hounds who are, you know, folks who have spent a lot of time out on the ground hound hunting. And so these are the people we have actually gathering our data for us. Um, so, you know, one of our study areas, you know, there are all these little grid cells. It's the same five by five kilometer square grids as Kelly had on hers. And, you know, every cell has a number. Um, part of the importance of this is that in order to decide, you know, how we work through our study areas is we actually create a randomized list of all our cells. And we actually try and move through and focus on those different cells in a random order. And that's important in order to mitigate uh, bias, you know, like if we always go to the best spots on the best days, you know, it's just going to impact our probability detection. So we try and move through in a randomized way. Um, so let's say today our husband and women, whoever's up, um, this is the cell that they are charged with surveying today. They're going to go to that area and it's their job to, you know, search for lines in that cell, um, as well as time permitting as much of the adjacent cells as they can. So they'll hit the ground on a snow machine, foot or truck, however they can, and they're going to carry a GPS unit so they can track their search efforts, since that is also part of the model. And so if this is our search day, um, or our start cell, you know, search effort might look something like this. So they're definitely hitting that start cell, but also they're going to be looking in some of the adjacent cells as well. Hopefully, somewhere along the way, they find a fresh lion track. Um, the houseman and women then have to decide, you know, are they able to run the track? They have to figure out, you know, is it safe for their dogs? Are there wolves in the area? Are there hazards? You know, are there other hunters in the area who, you know, we, all, we don't want to disturb their hunt? Um, is the track heading into private land where we don't have access? You know, questions like that. Um, hopefully they're able to go then and grab their hounds and collar them up and get them ready, um, put them on the trail. Uh, they then run the race wherever that might take them. Um, and hopefully that ends up with a lion in a tree. The contractors then use a um, CO2 powered dart rifle with a biopsy dart. So this is a sharp sort of small hollow tipped dart that um, when it hits the lion actually will pull out just a really small tissue sample. And that gives us a really high quality genetic um, sample. Um, we also collect hair and scat samples during our work um, as we find them, you know, especially if there's a track that we can't run for whatever reason. You know, we can backtrack and look for hair and scat, and those often will also work as samples. Um, and we also collect samples from harvested lions within the grid or within the area around our study area. Um, so all those different kinds of data, we send those to the lab, and the lab analyzes them and then sends back the individual and sex ID for all our captures, and then that is what goes into the seeker model. So um, now we're going to kind of just talk about the West Central ecoregion. This is this large area we're focusing on. Um, it's a pretty big area. We cover all the Bitterroot, over to Butte, Helena, part of the front, and all the way over to Lewistown. So it's a really large, you know, area. Um, it is part of three different FWP management units. We are part of Region 2, Region 3, and Region 4 in this ecoregion. Um, and here's that map of the RSF. So this is the habitat quality. So again, those red areas are the predicted highest habitat quality for lions. Blue is the lowest. So there's, you know, a little bit more mix in this ecoregion than there was in the Northwest ecoregion. There's certainly some big chunks of really good lion quality habitat and then some bigger chunks of less quality habitat. Um, and I'm going to go now into sort of the monitoring that we did and the results from our two different uh, monitoring areas. Um, that we did in the West Central Eco region. So we started out in Lincoln, monitoring uh, the winter of 2021-2022, and so that study area is roughly Lincoln over to Rogers Pass and then down to Avon. Um, there's fairly high habitat quality in that study area, so 75% of the cells had an average RSF value of 0.81 or greater. Um, the team had fairly good access in that study area. There was some big private ranches that they didn't have access to, but where they were able to get around, they had decent, decent, decent ability to get around with the tracks. Um, and this shows, this map shows where all the data points came from. So those purple ones with harvested lions. Um, if they're outside the grid, that means they were actually first detected by the crew inside the grid and then harvested outside. Um, so they collected 63 samples and ended up having 34 unique individuals. They had 13 males, 21 females, and they actually had 18 of those individuals had recaptures. Uh, so that was a pretty 
I think that's the highest recapture rate we've had in the monitoring so far. Um, so the seeker estimated overall density of about two lions per 100 kilometers squared and an estimated 120 lions with activity centers in the state space. So what that means is basically activity centers is like the center of the home range. Um, and we, we estimate the number of lions, not just within the grid that we surveyed, but in this state space, which is this rectangular buffer around our grid. And the, we do that because lions have large home ranges and they're very mobile. So an, an animal that might have a, you know, a home range center over here, um, you know, it might still wander into our grid. So we still want to consider that area. So the supplemental monitoring area that we worked on last winter was over in White Sulphur Springs area, the castles and Little Belt Mountains, so south of Great Falls, you know, west of Hobson. Um, there was slightly lower habitat quality in this area um, than any of our previous monitoring areas. 75% of the cells had an average RSF value of 0.7. There were definitely some, you know, a lot more high elevation habitat kind of in the middle that had lower habitat quality. Um, we had much more limited access in this study area. So this is the, the search rec, um, routes from all of our contractors. There were some big chunks of areas we couldn't get to at all because they were roadless or areas with just you know one road going through a pretty large area. Um, and it was a much larger study area than the previous study areas. Uh, we collected 62 samples, which ended up being 44 unique individual lions, about half male and female. Um, again, this map shows where all the different uh, samples came from the purple were the harvested samples. Um, and importantly and unfortunately, we had a really low recapture rate. Um, only five individuals had recaptures. So this is something you know Alex and Kelly both talked about is that the model is really built to um, it really needs recaptures in order to work how we want it to work. Um, and so these few recaptures are going to lead to higher uncertainty than we would have liked and then we've had in some of our previous um, results. And unfortunately, we can't go back and fix that. That's just how the cookie crumbled. Um, so we're just gonna have to move forward with what we have, but just keeping that in mind, is we'll have higher uncertainty because we had fewer recaptures. Um, so that seeker estimated the density of around 2.8 lines per 100 kilometers squared. Um, an estimated 327 lines total with activity centers in the state space. So again, that's that big rectangle around the, um, the study area. And now Alice is going to talk about our extrapolation. Okay, so um, extrapolation, exciting time. But for the two state spaces, we have an estimated total of 453 lines within those two squares. And, but we still need to figure out an estimate for the rest of the region. So this is where that extrapolation comes into play. So we need to figure out how many lines we need to add to those 453 to cover the whole ecoregion, which is where this relationship between habitat quality or those RSF values and density comes into play. So RSF or habitat quality is across the bottom. You have low quality habitat on the left, high quality habitat on the right. And then density, line density is on the y-axis. And some of you have probably already noticed this gigantic spike on the right. This is problematic. Um, so essentially, there's a couple of reasons why this happened, but we're getting these line estimates of that like 300 lines per 100 kilometers squared, which is not really feasible. And the model is really not performing in this part of the relationship. And there's a couple of reasons why this is happening, but Essentially, it's a problem. And for comparison, this blue line is the relationship if we use the, this blue line is the relationship that we observed in the Northwest Eagle region for habitat quality to density. And then the green line is Little Belt and the red line is Beacon. So we're getting very different results than what we observed in the Northwest Eagle region. And ideally, we would go back and we go back to the West Central region and we sample again, but we don't have time for that. And so what we decided to do was, so this black line is when we merge the Little Belt and Lincoln together into one relationship. We still have that massive spike, but since we are so uncertain and it's this high quality habitat relationship, and in those grid cells that we searched in the West Central region, we didn't really have those many cells with high quality habitat. So the model doesn't really have data to go off of in that region. 
but the Northwest ecoregion did have a lot of high quality habitat with more similar values to that portion of the graph. So what we did was we looked at the Northwest ecoregion and we said, what is the estimated maximum density of lions using that relationship? And we plugged that in as a cap. So the black line is the relationship that it's modeling that we don't believe is accurate because it's really giving us unfeasible values. And so then we took information from the Northwest ecoregion to kind of inform it and apply this cap to make it more reasonable. So then what we did was we took the areas outside of those grid cells and we broke it into a series of grid cells and we took the habitat quality measurement for each of those and we plugged it into the equation and we got a population estimate for each grid cell and we added them all together to get our total ecoregion estimates. So there's three estimates on here. Try not to get too panicked about numbers. So I'm going to walk you through it. So the top estimate is that estimate using that averaged equation, so that black line we looked at that goes really high. And this for the areas outside those grid cells is giving us a line density estimate of 5.6 lines, which is higher than what we observed in those state spaces, which is partly why we're like, this is not a good model. So that's estimating about 2,500 lines for the entire eco region, which, like I said, we think it's high. For comparison, we have the estimate using the Northwest relationship. So that blue, that light blue line in that first graph, that was a lot lower and didn't have that giant spike. So that's estimating a lot lower density. So we're at about 1.9 lines per 100 kilometers and only about 1,170 lines per over the entire East region. So this is, these estimates are adding that, those 453 lines. So we are taking those, we did add those things in. So this is the total East region. But the relationship did look different than what we observed in the West Central region, so we don't want to use that equation to look at the line density in the West Central region because they look different. So then we have our cap relationship. So taking that West Central relationship, but capping it at the estimated maximum density that we have for the Northwest region. So then that takes our density estimate to about 2.5 lines per 100 kilometers squared, and our total population estimate for the entire eco region is 1,402 lines. So lots of numbers, I know, but that's kind of the range of uncertainty that we're getting. So how these densities compare, so we have the Lincoln estimate for line density on the left, then we've got little belts next to it. So you can see, since those are informed by all of the data, we've got a lot tighter. We have a lot more, less uncertainty around those. We've got that black line that spiked really high. We have a lot of uncertainty around that. There's that spike. There's a lot of uncertainty around that spike. We're not that confident with that model. And that's why we're getting these giant, this giant amount of uncertainty around what's going on. This bar right here is if we use that Northwest relationship, and then we have the one that's the West Central relationship that's capped at that maximum density. Okay. So across the entire state now, we're gonna compare some line density. So we've got some previous research that's been done, the Northwest area, and then all of our West Central estimates which again, you can see for the West Central area, we've got pretty big uncertainty bars around everything just because of how things happen. But overall, the, the medians are pretty similar. It's not too far out of bounds for what we're getting, but lots of uncertainty that we need to take into account when we're talking about what we wanna do in the future. So the takeaway, I know it was a lot of numbers, uncertainty is high, but we still need to make some decisions about the seasons. And so the goal for today is to focus on that. We will be carrying forward all three of those estimates. So when we're talking about how some potential things we do in the future are gonna impact the population, we're gonna use all three of those estimates so you can take all of them into account. And it's a little complicated, but you'll get the full picture hopefully. And with that, we have time for questions. Yes. So on your recapture, do you mm -hmm. find that the majority of those are females? 
for the little belt area, it was four female recaptors, one more male. Mostly female? Yes. That's pretty obvious in most people that know lying. But, and, and what is your recapture um, facing? How often do you go out? I mean, I could probably say not in your study, but can you tell me? Yeah, so it's five months. So each month there will be calling them. You know, a different sort of part of the model. So it, I recapture the same lion, you know, today and tomorrow. It's, we're not going to be able to use that as a recapture because it's within the same month. So it's each month. I recapture the same animal December, January, February, and March. Those are four different recaptures. But yeah. Um, can you tell me the ungulate, uh, the elk population estimate in this region that we're, we're working on right now? Uh, in the little bells? In all in the whole area. Oh, the whole area? The, the estimated population? Yeah, basically. Do we have an estimated elk population for whole the region? My, my question is this. Like, it, at the low end, we're looking at 1,400 lions in the area, right? Basically. The estimated, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can look at like we have information for all of our over objective and objective that you can look at on the screen if that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at the number of elk lions killed each year. I mean, we're killing more, more elk than we're in the whole area, probably. And for the number of lions that you're asking, right? There's a lot of uncertainty. So some of using that. You wouldn't have an elk left if you had that one lion. Which is why we think there's a lot of uncertainty. and. We know that um, we need to take it in there now. I could probably help you with the elk question a little bit. Um, so that little belts, the white sulfur spring side, the elk population is extremely high. Right. You get over on the southwest side, you know, along that Smith River, Trout Creek, it's extremely high. But then when you circle around back to the north side, then the elk population drops quite a bit. And then the east side, it's, you know, kind of above average, but it's a lot of migration. And believe it or not, the elk will migrate from the Snowy Mountains over to the Little Bells. Yeah. So, but the, the south side of the, the White Sulphur Springs, you know, they, everybody goes down there and shoots three out a year. More questions? Yeah. When you're, yeah, when you're just talking about habitat, are you talking about mountain lion habitat that I've been taking it? What, what considerations as far as the ungulate habitat as well, like habitat changes and stuff? And that stuff factors into your things as well. Like, so the RSF was built using a bunch of different, it's, it's specifically for mountain lion habitat, sure. specifically during their time. Sure. And so, I mean, there's a lot of habitat variables that go into that. I listed a few of them, but I. Um, so those are, you know, some of those are similar, like obviously there has to be ungulate here maybe the lion habitat, but it was built specifically for lion habitat. Right. Well, sure. uh, I can maybe answer that a little bit, but that RSF model doesn't account for any No deer density, no elk density. And the reason for that is a statewide model and lions are eating different things everywhere. And so what the model basically says is mid-elevation rugged forest areas that they find mountain. And if you think about it, there is something for them to eat. Some kind of ugly everywhere. So that's why there's a, some of those things are also correlated with where white tail deer go to Northwest Montana or mule deer go in central eastern Montana and where elk live. So it's like the same variables, mid-elevation kind of habitat. But it's not explicitly a thing. Do you guys do it in kilometers instead of miles? Ready? For the estimate? Yeah, they're in kilometers. I know, but why? Um, <laughs> science is always better. <laughs> <Science. laughs> <Science. laughs> <Science. laughs> the reason for that is just because that's how the densities are reported everywhere that have been. Yeah, uh, through time, you know, using different methods. So well, for us, we need more models. <laughs> Yeah, it's like but you never say that we're going to go to hot spring for 20 kilometers. I mean, unless you're European, or Canadian. Canadians do that. Right. right. I'd be yeah. curious what you do the kilometers. No, it's that. just a way, like, especially as we're developing these methods, that we could, you know, ground proof it. Right. Like, compared to different parts. I mean, 
I mean, I don't know the conversion. Yeah, yeah I'm not, I don't know what the conversion event is. Well, yeah. How many kilometers is per? Uh, yeah, so it's just short of a mile or 0.6 or anything. 0.6 of a mile. That's what I just, when you're looking at these estimates, you're going 300 cat per kilometer or whatever kilometer. So I was just curious. Yeah, it's um, like two point something kilometers equals a mile. So. No, so. Yeah, we're not very smart. <laughs> we're quite a bit ahead of schedule, so I want to encourage everyone to ask more, more questions, <laughs> not just to these guys, but to the whole nice team that we have here. You know, they're a great resource. I know these one person has to leave. So, uh, yeah, we can take a little more time for questions before we go on a break. I just got one question. I don't think you'd be able to factor it in, but I know the little belts already had like the, the snow, second highest snowless on record this year. So do you think that affected uh, your recapture because all the lines moved down low and then who knows, you know, a lot of your stuff was on the edge of it and nothing in the middle. Absolutely. I think that's a pretty big reason why we didn't get very many recaptures. It's not um, you know, there were different areas where in December and January we were seeing cats and a lot of undulates, and then, you know, by February they were just gone. So it was a uh, historic snowpack year, yes. and that's just how it went. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you tried to confirm these results, you know, because you have like 2.8 lines per 100 square kilometers at, you know, 62 miles square? Do you ever take that and go try to find? Right. Well, that is an average, and so it does link back to habitat quality, and so you'll get patches with really high quality habitat, which will be over that, and right. patches with under that, and so it kind of depends what counties cut out that it, you get for a density estimate. Um, for the for the state for the SDR model, so the model we talk about all the time for that grid cell. Um, it does estimate line density for every portion of that. And so I feel like because you're never going to be able to go out and find every line in the area. Yeah. And so we can't really ever get at this is an exact count of this line, the lines for this area. So we're always going to think it's always going to be an estimate. Now, just one thing to say about that. That is true. Like historically, the way to estimate lines energy is very similar to how we used to estimate wolf density. Go out, capture, start tolerating, start mapping home ranges, trying to get them all mapped, and you can see where there's a hole, probably another female, or where you don't have a male collar with seven female home ranges, that kind of thing. But doing it that way, we never got a sense of how many transient lines were there. Which also get harvested as long as they're not with young, they're legal to harvest, right? So this method is all independent learning, uh, including ones that have home ranges and ones that may not have home ranges. That's the difference. But there is no way to like we can ground through this sort of in simulation world, but in the real world, there's no way to know like what how many lines are actually there. So there's not, that's why we, I said before, like we do this for 100 square kilometers, like you can look and see, is this totally unreasonable compared to what other people have found? And all of our density estimates from this method are kind of in line with what people know about land biology. And just to, to make a conversion, we're generally in the range of like two to four lines per 100 square kilometers in these estimates. And that's about five to 10 lines per 100 square miles. And it's, you know, that's super variable because the habitat is patchy, especially in the deeper region where you get the big valley bottom with a core habitat and you get really good habitat and you get high elevation and core habitat. So it's kind of, kind of a question here. So we know, you know, the whole belts, the, the belt studies in Africa, basically, or According to chart, and you're going to average out for the Lincoln study, which was pretty accurate. Then six years, they'll, when you come back in six years, 
they get a much higher recapture rate through the conditions and you know things work out better. Um, then is it going to show a major decline? You're going to show that it has major decline over the past six years in lion populations when it really didn't. You know what I mean? I think I know what you mean. Um, with with that, I mean, hopefully, with if we get a lot of recaptures in the future, it should give us a strong the uncertain. It'll still be within our uncertainty range for what we think is going on. Uh, I don't see us changing outside of that because well we do have a pretty wide uncertainty range and so any effort in the future would look at that and so it's we're not that confident with this estimate and then if we come in in six years and we get a really good estimate and we're really confident with it well it we it will still be comparing it to the range of estimates we're looking at for right. this year i'm just thinking like so that six years later when we come you need to get back and recycle mm -hmm. to that area if you get a, a really good result and the line number goes from where you have 3.8 or something down to 2.2 then is or is the commission or somebody going to look at that and say well we're over honey our cats we need to regulate honey do you, you, you know what i'm saying like it's going to give us false number going forward. Who are they going to say, Oh my gosh, there's this giant decline in cats in six years? We got to cut the hunger the way back. I don't know. You know people will look at it six years. Yeah. It's going to be hard to evaluate what the effect was for it to need to do. And that's just a fact. Right? There's no way around it. So when they do it, too, they have a you know, probability, you know, you choose that certainty level um, for your line. You know, yeah. so did they be, were you, the, all of these have a number, like the certainty level of 75% or? Yeah, we we'll definitely be able to make those kind of estimates. Like, how confident are we that it was stable oh, or chocolate is all for each Yeah, we were okay. able to say that. But Alex, what she said is also right because the high degree of uncertainty right now, our confidence in the amount of change, if any, is going to be low in six years. Okay, that, that was but yeah, yeah. No. But I look there, I just want to point out though that that's just reality. You're gonna you're gonna deliberate this and come up with a recommendation, and that is gonna be a fact that they have to live with because the line is still have to get that. But this whole program, you know, the plan that Jay wrote, it sets us up so that over time we can start to reduce that uncertainty. And that's not just in this eco region, in every eco region. As we see what happens when different parts of the team get put in place, when we go back with repeated monitoring, 20 years from now we'll be in a better position than we are now. We have to start somewhere. It's not easy to estimate line density, but for this time period, this six year time period, and looking forward, there's just going to be a lot of uncertainty. I got a question. Um, given the, the fact that you're pretty grossly over your, your population estimate and then you live well, um, have, you, have you had any discussion about going back and resurveying that area? And just doing a little reset? I mean, I the plan is set for a while in the future. I don't there wouldn't be a budget for that. Because the right. conditions were bad, we couldn't get to there. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty tough last year. I think we're moving ahead with the plan that was put forth, and we're just gonna have to accept that last year wasn't a perfect survey and move forward with that. And we get we have to move on to the southwest. We haven't even started monitoring there. We still have two winners monitoring there and do our loop walk there. And I think it's just again, like Justin said, over time as we do these surveys multiple times, and again, there is with the supplemental monitoring areas, we have some flexibility, you know, whether we go back to the little belts or we decide to do a different monitoring area in the West Central Eco region instead, you know, that's all kind of something to be decided in the future. But again, every time we come back to these, they're gonna get more certain and that won't be the but yeah.
Does anybody know the full population of lions in the in the whole state? It's estimated like three to six thousand, kind of a big. I mean, I know it's hard to estimate. We did. We ballparked like that using this kind of method of extrapolating. And what we even Brian did an exercise this year where we kind of extrapolated the northwest density based on habitat quality across the state. We've done it different ways, and we always get to that number, you know, between three and six thousand lines in the state, but we don't really know. And we have like like they're saying, well, listen, just that we haven't monitored, we haven't done this kind of thing in a big chunk of the state. So I mean, yeah, somewhere maybe five thousand ish. Is there a number that's when it gets low enough that it's an endangered, I mean, kind of wolf thing? They really don't, don't know how many are out there. Well, the more, I don't, I don't, I don't, like, the more concerned that is, but I was not looking at that. Yeah, I don't think it's ever gave me some error, but I was curious if there's a number, a percentage. But we don't think. It's hard to say because that, you know, you get to the realm of the ESA. Yeah. Right. Hard to predict. Google, Google, like. I have a question for whoever might answer it. Um, <laughs> um, we've had like 30 years of the quota system, correct? Uh, you know, in, at least in Region 3. And there's been ups and downs with people working out quotas every year, you know, and it changes. And have you used any of that information in this new? Uh, Any information like, oh, okay, we, we say in Alpharn, for instance, one year we had 14 cats available, we killed them all. And the next year we had seven, and the next year we had six, and it's been that kind of thing for 30 years. And so we've got to a status quo with these quotas over the years where we pretty much know within a cat or two where we need to be every year. I'm wondering if you guys are looking at that data and using it in this new uh, population of models. It doesn't use the quotas, it does use the number of harvested every year though. So the integrated population model, which is the next step in the we'll talk a lot about in our next meeting in October uses the number of harvested. Mm -hmm. But we haven't incorporated quotas. When you incorporate their quotas, will you factor in the quotas that aren't met or just harvest? The model currently is just set up to incorporate harvest. If incorporating quota has well, that's more of a human dimension thing. And so it's usually not incorporated into IPMs just because there's so much of a human dimension aspect. And then you'd want to incorporate a lot more about that side of things, which would be very mixed and it's not a lot more complicated. So usually to keep it simple, it's usually just number harvested. Some of the areas in my area, the quotas aren't aren't even met, and they raise the quota forty percent. Um, you know, so, I think the, I mean, the well, it's still aligned. I mean, it depends on who's hunting that year too. I mean, it could be the weather. The weather it could be there. There's guys that don't shoot females in our area. There's a lot of guys that don't. Some of the male quotas are not met. Well, so and they're hunted. That's we have we have met and stuff. There's a lot of like this year. There's a lot of outfitters in our area that didn't weren't able to go out because they were also like HVAC guys or whatever they were, and they just didn't have time to get out there. They kind of do the heavy lifting in our area. But I think that's a lot. I don't think you can really determine line population by quota. I don't know how some of the other ones around the state are, but I know that the dual special management unit when they. When they did that when they wanted that they wanted to get as many cats as they could there because that's all urban and they've never got that quota but they keep it high this would keep and i live in that unit and i had a cat kill a deer in my driveway last year so they're there what what is the um about the the um 
cap recruitment ratings and up and down and all that. Is there an ideal cap recruitment? Is there what do you what is that predict or like who's who's determined that? What's the to maintain the population, I guess, so the biology there. I'm going to be trying to get a. It's really hard to say. So, in a, in a, a body, uh, sort of stable population with cow harvest at a kind of standard level, like some opportunity, but we're not trying to reduce the population. Yeah. Recruitment, maybe like 25 to 35 uh, calves per 100 cows. We'll keep the population stable. Maybe 20 to 30, somewhere in that range, but it really depends in this area. Like some of you have mentioned, a lot of these elk herds are really high, and the uh, cow harvest is wide open, and we are trying to harvest more cows. And in that case, a high calf recruitment ratio is not really desirable. You know, so something lower would help, you know, get the population back in. So it's really context dependent, but what's, what are we trying to do with running the population? And I would say not just for elk, but for mule deer, the, the other under the species too. Any chair, it's kind of context dependent. Like what, just like you guys are going to talk about where do we want this mountain lion population to go, what direction? As you well know, that is for elk population, that people will debate that for a long time. Some time as we give them, and then we get it in an objective in a plan, which is in whatever two to three months, maybe. And then we try to stick to that. We'll set seasons to try and get there. And like Kelly talked about, this the seasons for the carnivores can be set to try to help us get there too, to some degree, you know, because that will affect recruitment. Like mountain lions eat young enough. So if there's places where we want to see more elk and the recruitment is low, we have seen where we increase lion harvest and we can have a, an increase in elk recruitment if that is the goal for a period of time. The period of time is that increased lion harvest occurs. And when it went back to what it had been with no female harvest in Beirut, that effect went away. I mean, it's kind of a temporary thing. Because Ryan populations are really dense. Are there areas in this eco region that now need to be addressed like that? Or? Well, that's a question for all these folks that are here. I do think probably still on the left side of the river, I think that's still a concern. The farther east you go, it's less of a concern for health. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, elk numbers are down in the elk horns. How much of it is true to lion? But my professional opinion is uh, human harvest has a far greater impact. But then that goes into the Sumatra a little bit. I mean, I'm just saying that that's something that we should be looking at in this meeting. Are there other areas that we need with that? Yeah, I mean, I, we've got all that information about elk population status relative to. When you guys look at, at uh, the elk population, when, is it, when you guys do the count, I mean, is this a uh, few jump for the migration, the elk migration, like from where we're at in 250, 270, especially 270, huge migration corridor that comes out of the vehicle, right? So that's going to potentially change your elk numbers. I mean, how, how do you guys count? account for that or when do you count for elk? So at least in the middle group, we count them when they're still on bear range before they migrate. Okay. And so we compare that year to year, you know, so we're always getting that mentoring elk population. Okay, so it's a constant. Yeah. Yeah. Based on, okay. I mean, it is a little bit more difficult in like the West Fork because we know that there's a migratory component in Idaho. Sure. Um, and so there's elk there at hunting season that are not there when it comes to them. And so that's harder to get a handle on. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Pretty much all of our elk surveys are done typically from for the most part, some time probably in mid January, so as late as early April. And, you know, watch it depends on timing, pilot availability, but generally, it's a, still on winter, year on winter rain or early spring rain up areas. Uh, you know, one nice thing for most most of the West Central eco region, 
elk occupied area that we typically get good counts on. Um, I can't speak to you know all of the Rebecca's area, but uh, um, you know, it's not like northwestern Montana where you got heavy timber. And, and we still run into the issue depending on the day we're surveying, we end up with proof spell and timber. But for the most part, you know, I think most of us feel we get a pretty pretty good count on our elk in the county districts if we know if we have good survey time, you could get issues in that. Well, 250 is an interesting thing, Nevada, isn't that kind of an anomaly? Because we, we have very limited hunting up there. Mm -hmm. Mule yeah. deer, there's hardly, there's only a few tags for mule deer and a few tags for the elk. But yet the elk are not get hunted. There's no cows up the West Fork, I believe. Ten. Ten. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, a few, and a few bulls, and what percentage of those get harvested? Probably pretty low. Yeah, there's the elk are getting annihilated up there, as well as the sheep, as well as the deer. And I don't know. It, That's what, a predator pet for sure. What's that? That's a predator pet for sure. It is. Yeah, I just wonder that what percentage of that is biased. Well, we had that one study. It was something was that from 2015, 2014. That study. That was that was 250, right? And it was something. Like, was it like? Yeah, was it like 30 yeah. percent? They determined what was lying, and like four percent with wolf or something like that. Well, and, and your numbers are showing the highest lion densities up there too. Well, and, so, and part of this process, part of this process, is identifying areas where we maybe want to focus a little bit more harvest because of those issues. So that's all going to come up. I don't probably next time or this time. It, it was I would I miss that? Is it? It looked like the highest density of lions was up there, right? Is really difficult, yeah. is that right? Four, yeah, it's not four. Four. yeah, the highest. Anyway, I don't know. It wasn't as high as the northwest part of the state, but it was high. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk to Rebecca just a little bit about the sheep? What happened to your sheep population up there? You don't need to see now? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, so, so we do have a sheep herd in there in the west coast that I can claim. Um, and we did a really small, on scale collaring effort on the sheep, and we only had maybe a dozen collars. Um, and about a third of them uh, were from the fine lions up there. Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, Steve, you, you hunt that area and, and yeah. you think that you kind of saw lions that were targeting that sheep herd. They seem to be always there, living right in their back pocket. Yeah, so we, you know, we've got issues. And it's, it is a part of it compared to the rest of the dinner room. It's different. It's more forested. It's more rugged. It's, it's more difficult for people to access. It's farther away. It's not an easy hunt. So there's a lot of issues in the West Coast that kind of differentiate it from the rest of the area. Yeah, and some of the information from across the Western United States, particularly in regard to sheep populations, you will sometimes get individual, literally individual lions. They start specializing in, in sheep. So it's not always the a function of the overall lion populations. It's literally sometimes a function of those one or two lions that just start, you know, specializing in that particular prey base. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I killed an old female on my ranch. She killed three of our sheep in one week. And you know, this this lion thing is so dynamic. I'm from Gardner. You know, in 1997, they killed 2,700 cows in the late season hunt. You know how many cows they kill in the late season hunt today? None. It's the greatest loss of hunting opportunity in the world. We killed five pounds in 16 days of those the season. I had four more cats to run that week. It's an unlimited sheep area. About a dozen years ago, they took away that unlimited sheep area. The Borders Department's never been given back. 87-1-217 state statute man mandates that predators will be managed to the benefit of owners. That's a law. It's as simple as under orange, granny snake, it's a G coach, right? That's why we're here today. One thing I'll mention is that we do have a printer here. We've got the screen. If more questions come up, we can print things out for you guys. We can put information up on the big screen. So 
uh, we have the ability to continue to try to answer questions throughout the day. I got one one last question. Can you go out for your recapture and when you when you go to the cat recapture? Do you actually target cat that you know are in an area? Well, often like if like we have our cell that we have to go to that area, that area and go and maybe we get one cat, but we stock tracks of another cat and then another cat there, we'll go back there the next day. The idea is to get you know, we have to go revisit some places to get all the cats that are there at that time. We will certainly do that. So you'll bypass the track that you know is one you've recaptured, that you captured before. To bypass the track? Yeah. Or do you, will you run all the tracks? Just, yeah, we try and yeah. we try and run all the tracks that are in that general area. So right. sometimes you know we'll, we'll spend multiple days there if we have to. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So it's five after right now. Why don't we take a 15 minute break, come back at 10 20, and we'll get started on the next part. <laughs>
So, thank you everyone again for being here. Thanks for uh, bearing, bearing with us through those presentations. I know we really got into the weeds. We're going to move into the next part of this, which is us listening to you instead of you listening to us. Except we're going to have one more short presentation just to remind you of the process here, what we're going to do next. So we're going to start working on the problem statement, like Sarah said at the beginning, this is really important step. So we're just going to dive into that a little deeper and then hear from all of you about your problem statement. Take it away, Sarah. All right. See, so again, this is our next step here, and it's the critical first piece of this whole process. Again, this is something that may seem frustrating to you at times, but bear with us, please. Um, because again, without yeah. doing this, we could end up solving the wrong problem and using the wrong tools and education. And then it must have not wrong solution entirely. So um, we're going to dive right into this. And we're going to ask you to consider a number of elements as you think about defining the problem. So first, the decision maker who will actually implement the decision. The trigger, why the, the decision needs to be made and what does why does it matter? The action or what is the decision? What actions need to be taken? What are the objectives? Constraints, so these can be legal, financial, political, and are these perceived or real constraints? Frequency and timing in this decision? And then the scope, how broad or complicated is the decision and what is the temporal or spatial scale? So again, you've seen this example problem statement. It has those elements embedded within it. We can look at a different one, uh, looking at the pneumonia uh, die-offs in Big Bird Sheep that we came up with this problem statement uh, over a decade ago. And so the elements in this example, this first the trigger is that here we had these big horn sheep die-off events happening, and they have really affected the conservation and public enjoyment of big bird sheep. So that is the trigger. The decision maker is wildlife managers and biologists. The action is looking at risk assessment and decision analysis tools that help prioritize and allocate resources to identify and manage the risk of major disease events. And these tools need, in this case, the flexibility in their implementation so that decisions about big sheep management and conservation are local and community based. Constraints are that we need to prioritize and allocate resources, for example, and then the scope. And the frequency and timing is that uh, this is going to be local community based and um, we need this kind of flexibility overall and management actions and tools that can be implemented within this monitoring framework so that we can see how effective they are over time. So um, that's just another example for you of what a problem statement can look like. Again, as you think about this, reminding you to stay within the charge about the population trend, uh, um, increase, decrease, or stable, and the percent change, and then we can think about LME and MSVs potentially. We'll get more into those details later probably, but these are the things you can keep in mind as you're thinking about defining the problem. Um, so again, when we think about starting this, we'll ask you to try to consider these different elements. And the first thing we want to do is actually have everyone spend what, five minutes. Just uh, you all have a notepad in front of you. If you don't, we have some more up here we can pass out. But just start thinking about these on your own. And we'll do a quick round of sharing, and then we'll start working in small groups to work on um, putting together a problem statement as a small group, and we'll come back and share those too. Any questions about this first step here? What do you want us to do exactly? So, <laughs> so uh, try to think about these different questions. So address as many of these as you can think of right now, and just think about um, the describing the problem at hand yeah. and what we're here to do. I'll just say our goal for the end of the day today is to have a prob problem statement that we all can agree on. So we're going to start by doing this individually, slowly work in groups and try to get by the end of the day to one that we can all agree. This is the problem that we're trying to make a decision about. So we're going to start with this and have you guys try to just do your best for a couple of minutes and then we'll talk about it and think about it as a group to try to write a problem statement. What, what do you think the problem is? How are you going to answer these questions? Thank you. 
let's think about one more minute, wrap up any final thought you have. Doesn't have to be perfect for this round. So as we move into this part of the work, I just want to remind everyone of our ground rules. The core of that is mutual respect. And um, one thing that I'll be doing is if I'm hearing a lot from someone, I might ask other people to speak up. If I'm not hearing from someone, I might reach out. We have exercises like this throughout the day to help make sure we're hearing from, from everybody. So um, with that, let's dive in. Is anybody willing to share some thoughts or sketches or ideas that they wrote down as they started thinking of a problem statement? Well, I'll start, I guess I will. Um, and and if you'll say your name before you start just for now, <laughs> so we can all be calling buddies, John Powell. Thank you. But um, my, I mean, I'm, I know we're not supposed to be political at all. We don't have enough biological input in the decision making. I mean, the commission ultimately is going to make the decision and be harder than people and their information is basically going to be put off. Well, it's going to be considered, but ultimately it's going to be the commission, I think. So, and then in that respect, I think somehow maybe biologists need to be able to make some decisions. Appreciate your statement. I think we're getting a little outside of the scope and charge for today, but yeah, thanks for yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the problems is we're making decisions for a very diverse group of people with different interests. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I actually wrote down the eco region is so diverse. Um, and it's really hard because, like, we're loving what we're talking. You know, that's starting in the Seco region. But when you look in the Seco region, um, I just pulled up the emails um, for the areas I'm familiar with, five of the LMUs, and all of those LMUs are above objective for um, deer and elk numbers. Um, but that's not going to be the case everywhere. So um, I guess. I don't have a problem for the five areas I, I'm looking at because the deer and elk numbers are, are there. So that's going to be different for different individuals in different areas in this room. But um, the areas that I directly were involved with and all of the biologist numbers, those numbers, the only good species are good there. So therefore, um, I don't see a problem with the lion management in that area. You know, that, that section of the um, ecology. I think there's, we're being asked to make decisions with a lot of uncertainty. Um, and how do, we, how do we expect to make a decision based on that much of uncertainty as far as, you know, the methods that we use, the, the results of those methods? And I understand about how things extrapolate and, and that, but it just seems like we have. And kind of like Scott said, we, we have a lot of different issues of what we're seeing here in, in our area versus what they're seeing over in Hamilton or Gardner or wherever. <clears throat> and we're tasked with making decisions on this eco region for what's best for the eco region. And, and I get money and, and that, I get funding and stuff at the same time. There's a lot of, a lot of uncertainties that are going into this decision making. Or recommendation process. So, our, uh, <clears throat> to me, I definitely come from a different area of the state, right? With the eco region. So, I totally get that as far as the differences across this whole region. Uh, to me, it was fairly easy for a trigger. Um, we don't have enough ungulates, uh, primarily hunter, not an Um 
So to me, it's predator control. So action to me was really easy to increase predator, predator control measures, increase quotas, et cetera, on lines. Constraints uh, also want to maintain a sustainable number of mountain lines. They're important, they're important for hunting, they're important for the environment. And um, that's a constraint from my point of view to find what that balance is for line numbers. Um, for my primary thought for that, I guess. Thank you. Well, I think we're all in the same area. Okay. So, uh, same thing I said problem to me lines in our area. Decision needs to be made to bring back the ungulate population, at least you know, to a sustainable number there for those. And action is higher budget control, which we actually got for, for our area. I'm happy with what we have in our area with the numbers that the commission put out. So. Um, I say we just try it for a few years and, you know, in our area, that's the, the scope to try it for a few years and just like it, it's not, nothing permanent. So these things can be changed. So I think, if, you know, if we get to a point where it looks like the lion population is crashing and go back to the way it was, like, I mean, we used to get 100. I mean, our quota was over 100 for too many years back in the day. And, then they reduced it to 30, you know, 30, 35. I don't know. I think so. Now we're up back up to 70 or 80. I think is what it is. But even within that region, um, there's spots of it, parts of it we talked about a little bit that are um, and even harder. Some of the areas, you know, we might get our health numbers and others, you know, there's got to hard press to find them. So. You know, it's, it's a challenge, definitely a challenge trying to figure out where that is and, and what, how to come up with it. Uh, Todd Schmansky, a um, couple things I left out on my uh, intro. I've, I've owned and um, actively managed a cattle ranch for the last 40 some years and also i've been the city forester of the city of great falls for 33 years so it's both the science and the egg part uh, where my place is a cat wanders through every now and then so it's not that big an issue <laughs> but uh the trigger is you know everybody wants more deer and elk which is uh you go around the state, go on the east side of the snowies, and you'll find more elk than you'll ever see in most people's lifetimes. But uh, there, it's so complex, and unfortunately, the lion has taken the run in of it because uh, you raise a quota, you know somebody's going to go there and kill the cats. Boom, done, over with. Uh, it's a little better now that you got to pick a region, you don't get the quota hoppers. But anyway, like in your guys' area down there, uh, your elk numbers are down. Places where I go, there's a salient elk. But there's so many factors. It's just not the line. Uh, look, we got to go back. we got to go into the hunter numbers. I've been, I've hunted down there uh, on that 270 mule deer tag. Um, the check station had like 14,000 people go through it, you know. And so there's hunter numbers. There's our our forest is crap basically. There's no food. You know, they, every fire that pops up, we got to put out. And trees, something I know about, evolve over with fire. All our whole ecosystem evolved with fire. And so we eliminate the fire. There, there goes the browse a mule deer. They have to have browse and elk. They are a grass eater, but when they hurt the mule deer is when they switch over to browse because because their stomach allows them to. So it's you know just picking on the lines is kind of frustrating for me. I'm not an outfitter. I'm a more of a weekend semi-retired weekend hunter now because of age, but. Uh, uh, my daughter has a long legged boyfriend, so that helps. But anyway, so it's hard to. Uh, Montana is so wide and diverse. Um, I just think this up in the quotas and killing everything without doing anything about the other factors 
is, uh, you know, I'm frustrated with that. Uh, now, now in the last five, six years, maybe not. What's the name of that big ranch there out of Darby where all the elk in the years? Yeah. Prime example that their your elk study down there, I think, what is it, Rye Creek or something mm -hmm. off to the, yeah. the elk started moving to that ranch right at archery season. Um, you know, I, I've hunted most every Western state with hounds and big game. I do a lot of big game hunting. I've hunted every region in Montana. And all these other states, Arizona and stuff, you know, they the only way they can manage the people and the um, quality and quantity of animals is season dates and stuff. And so that's the frustrating part. I do not know the answer, but it's bigger than just up enough you know, killing 85 females out of the bitter run. It, it's way bigger than that. Um, unfortunately, this committee won't be involved with that, but I'd like everybody to keep that kind of in mind once we start. And now in the last five, six years, um, we got, uh, uh, Montana's gotten pretty attractive to some wealthy people and they're buying huge tracts of land. And, uh, then the minimal amount of hunting and that from the elk or, you know, some of the units uh, I hunt, you know, got tremendous elk. You can shoot three elk and shoot them like vermin down there. And so it's hard to come up with a definite answer. You know, this fellow down here, Gardner, you know, they wiped out that northern herd. I remember the days of the 27,000 elk. And yes, lines, I'm not disagreeing that the lions haven't ate some of the lion, but there's several factors. Your grizzly populations increase, they introduce the wolves. And where I hunt now, I hunt down in region seven. And, uh, you know, I do shed hunting, you know, and all that down there. The only time we see bears is uh, cabin season. And then once the, the um, elk or calved elk, the bears disappear, how many they're eating? I, you know, because some of this is animal country. So you see a big black bear out in the middle of, uh, you know, two sections of sagebrush, and one thing he's out there for, and that's to eat the calves. So, kind of, in my opinion, we're picking on the line a little too much, but I understand that is one of the things we can control more because. We find a track, you know, even though we are starting to bear hunt, but I don't think you can use hounds in the bitter You yeah. can. Yeah, you can. You can this area. Area. Yeah, okay. Then but hopefully, no. hopefully they can make a dent in bear population. Yeah, well, yeah. Because I just read in uh, Region 4, like 20 years ago, they killed uh, 80 some bears, you know, and like last year they killed 200 and some bears. So hopefully, you know, that. It's going to take a effort on everything and not just single off lines. And I guess I'm just rambling on too far. I probably didn't get to the point, but <laughs> then you're still thank you. <laughs> yeah, my scope, that's my school. Well, this it, it's unfortunate though. We have to factor in forage base and all that stuff, and just killing more lines don't do that. <clears throat> they will move themselves. They, you know, they run out of deer, you know, our deer seasons are ludicrous, you know, and how long they are and stuff. So, but, okay. Can we hear another voice? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I'm coming from a, I'll say your name again. Oh, sorry. My name is Joshua. And, um, and I'm coming from a hunting district that is like over management objectives for deer and elk. So we're not seeing some of the same problems that people have. We also do have a pretty robust cat population. But I think I'd like to clear up for myself whether we are looking to manage cats strictly for the benefit of deer and elk populations, or if you're looking to manage cats for the health of their own populations, so that I'm clear on what we're doing. Because there will be downstream effects of managing cats for the health of their own population that will impact deer and elk. We should certainly take all that into account. But I want to be clear about why we're doing it, so that I understand that. And then I think for me, the problem that we came up with here is like, 
how do we manage the mountain lion populations? And are we doing that not only for the benefit of deer and other sheep, but the health of their own population? And within that, is it possible to consider <clears throat> the social structure of given individual territories? Because if you're coming at this from just a numbers game, and you're like, there are X number of cats in this area, I'm gonna pull out X number of cats. Um, you can do that and you can just be like, okay, we didn't we didn't hit the population overall, cats were healthy, there's a lot of them out there. But you're gonna really disrupt the social structure of a given territory. And if you have uh, females in there raising young who are well behaved and are not going off into the world and causing problems and showing up at fucked up and eating them, maybe kicking them in the deep, then maybe you want them on the landscape. Um, so that would be something to consider when we're talking about age classing and what sex to target with, uh, with hunting opportunities. Um, in terms of who makes the decision, it sounds like we contribute to whatever we do and the, the commission ultimately makes that decision. Um, constraints seem to be kind of like how we decide to view uh, the management question, uh, whether it's just an equation of numbers, a means to an end for deer and elk. And hunter opportunities there, or are we prioritizing lions for their own right? Um, and do we view the cats as having a right to their own prey base, or is that strictly a resource that we want and are in competition with them for? And something to consider too is um, the ecosystem services that they provide. Mountain lions research is pointing towards the fact that they do not get chronic wasting disease, and so they are a fantastic cleanup crew for the forests and they will target the animals that are lower and are weaker. Can they hunt the most robust animal? Of course, they're amazing, but they will go after slow, easy things because they want food and it's risky to take down health with your face. So they don't get CWD. If we don't want CWD in our populations and we want those animals removed by an individual that cannot contract it and spread it, then they are an important ingredient to have on the landscape. And so these are things we should all take into consideration while we make these decisions. The decision maker came up in, in your comments just now. I haven't heard as much about that from others. Are we in agreement about who the decision maker is or do folks wanna talk a little bit more about that? Well, I would think the ultimate decision makers would be the public. Over you know, a bunch of years, I think the public is going to decide what we like to talk. You know, Montana's grown, and you know, pretty soon I can see where we're gonna to have to put in for tags for, for certain ungulates, you know. It's just everybody's brought it out, subdivisions are going in, more cap human conflict. And I think, you know. I would, I would think the goal would be to establish a, a number of lions that's good for everybody involved, you know. And unfortunately, the people in this room are probably the minority of what what's out there. You know, so you're, you're, you have a bunch of public that doesn't want to see a lion or don't, don't want to go out. There, there's some things in play right now, too. Um, That'll be interesting to watch. Utah just deregulated the lions. And so it'll be interesting to see what that does to the lions as far as managing and what they what happens to that population of lions and how they how they fare, as well as what it does for their their deer and elk. I think that's probably a push more, maybe an opinion, but um, I think they're really trying to manage for the deer and the elk. Care about the lions is kind of the the uh, opinion, or the, that's kind of the, what it seems like that is um, showing us. But um, I think I don't know, we could probably do a better job of managing the lions and and the deer and the ungulates, the deer and the elk. If we, I mean, I would hate to see that. Actually, I would hate to see that just totally. Lions being annihilated like that, and I'm not sure that will annihilate. Who knows? It'll be an interesting, an interesting study that we can kind of sit back and watch. I think. Um, anyway, just think that's an interesting perspective. There's a couple of things that have done that, and what has that done to their lions? 
Um, sorry, I thought I saw your. Did I see your thing? Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote wildlife management in Montana that's a first multi faceted situation. Management varies from region to region and LMU to LMU. The state is mandated by 87 217 to manage predators to the benefit of ungulates, protect people and livestock. There is no silver bullet. However, decades of status quo has left management in question. Predator pits need to be addressed. There is no silver bullet. That gentleman did on that. We have a grizzly issue. We have a black bear issue. We have a wolf issue. And you can't talk about this one issue like it's a silver bullet because it is not. But what we can talk about is like, I, maybe I'm going off task here, but in 314, I've lived there seven years. We closed that quota out. I could go home for Christmas and that quota is closed every year. This year we closed it in 16 days with five times. That's a token season. And we're trying, we've got sheep seasons that have never come back. We've got catastrophic stuff. It's always interesting to me how we sit in these rooms. I have been a professional wildlife manager for 20 years. Um, you can draw your line on the map. We're killing lines that are coming out of the Lamar Valley. They travel hundreds of miles. So with all due respect, you know, this little area that we've got, I've got lions coming in from East. You've got lions coming in from Idaho. Um, wildlife's complex, and we try to simplify it, and you just cannot. I don't think we have any idea how many lions. I was talking with Warren. You know, I went goat hunting on the Cook City side. Every drainage has lion tracks, and if you're paying attention in that. But if you look at your map, that's not suitable lion habitat. You can pull that back up and it's bright blue. There's lions in every drainage. that are never hunted, never touched. Some of the big old ponds, I'd be aerial down and out of the helicopter in the winter, guys. Backcountry, wilderness stuff. The worst of my career. Those lions are back. They're never hunted. You're not back there in any of that. Area. So your hand uh, uh, I, I, no, I was going to I wanted to ask you about you know the decision maker if it's law, then we I would guess it would have to be based on ongoing population. And we don't have this, we don't have an objective number. I mean, am I right or am I wrong? Well, the elk objective thing, I mean. That's a complex issue in itself. So the northern herd in 2001 was 21,500 strong. Karen Loveless comes in, and now our elk objective is 5,000. I was at those public meetings. I don't remember any of the public wanting it at 5,000. Personally, we feel like it should be 10. You know, go off on another thing. We're going to go down to Paradise Valley, and we're going to study lions. I'm wondering how you're going to get on several of these big ranches, because candidly, to be politically incorrect, they're so pissed off at FWP, you're not coming on. How do you sample that? And they won't let most of the houndsmen in because guess what? They don't kill lions. They can't have the seasons close. There's a lot of ranches I hunt on that they don't let the average houndsman on because guess what? The average rancher doesn't care if you treat 30 cats in a season, guys. They want cats dead. That's the reality. Complex. Hard for students. I think the lion's taking the biggest hit. Uh, Matt says, you know, and Todd talks about bear. I don't know how you really study if you're not studying all the other predators mm -hmm. that they're taking in terms of the population. Same with uh, my name is Scott and John here are going to the same stuff. You know, the Dumbo Lake, uh, growing up in youth, years ago, we didn't have the trails that you do now. So that uh, obviously affects the deer and elk population, but uh, people shoot them when we side by size and then we notice, you know. So it's, I don't believe it's just a lie. It's just the easiest target to go after. That's good. I also, I also view this lion, um, public view, of the lions right now seems to me that there's one behind every bush. And that the lions are also escaping. <laughs> and that we can put extraordinary control measures on lions where we can't put them on wolves. And we can't put them on grizzly bears, things that are protected. I mean, if you could do the same thing with wolves, it, 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 it'd be done. 
I mean, you, you can hammer down on the wolf just like you're going to hammer down on the lion. So I think public perception is a huge part of the problem right now. And education is a, a real low and people, people don't understand it. General rule, how many cats are really out there and what they're really doing? You know, so if we can get some sort of public perception change out there, I don't think things are going to change. So I'm going to try to reflect back some of what I'm hearing. If you can tell me if I'm hearing it right or you want to uh, update anything. So for the decision maker, or maybe in the short term commission, but in the longer term, the broader public are going to have an influence. Um, for the trigger, we've got our LEPOC meeting that we're at, but also perception that maybe ungulate populations are not exactly where everyone wants them to be. Um, for the action, that's pretty clearly mandated by our charge. We want to increase, stay the same, or decrease the line uh, harvest. Um, then we heard a lot about constraints and context. There's uncertainty. That's huge. There's complexity. There are multiple driving factors uh, for ungulate declines and for mountain lion populations. There are things happening at the ecosystem level and economic changes. Um, and then there are questions about the health of the mountain lion population itself whether that's something we care about or something that just matters for the ungulates. Um, frequency and timing, we're here, it happens again in six years, we know that, and we know the scope for this charge is, is uh, focused on this West Central region. Um, so th those are some of the things I heard. Sarah, if we could go back to the charge slide. Um, so we have a pretty narrow charge ahead of us today. And I recognize that a lot of the uncertainty and complexity, it feels really frustrating to not be able, be able to talk about that because we all know it's so important. But I do want to um, just remind us of our charge today and the decision that we've all kind of agreed to, to convene around. So um, yeah, here's some of the things that we're charged with and not charged with. I'm not trying to stifle discussion, but just as a reminder of what brought us here and, and where we're headed. So. Does um, is, is it have to be one or the other? Or could we say, hey, in region two, 250, we want more. And, and in some of these other regions, we want less, or we like it where it is. Do we make those decisions, or do we have to say, oh, we want it up, or we want it down, or we want it leave? So I'm going to turn to Justin and Brian, who might be able to tell us. Okay, well, yeah, you guys, one of your charges is helping us to identify areas of emphasis, local zones. Um, so just as a very brief example of the Northwest Eek region, they did identify ungulate local zones where we could identify harvest as an option to look at. So that is something that you guys can address. Okay. In response to that, did the commission take that into consideration now? In this past June commission meeting? Yeah. No, I don't. Um, well, they accepted our recommendation from the Northwest Leapfrog Committee, but then this year we kind of took a new direction. So I don't know how much of that previous recommendation informed. Yeah. 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 So this is a narrow charge. One yeah. thing that we do want to make sure we say is that um, any issues that come up that you guys think are really important we can put in what we're calling the parking lot. And those are ideas that we want to save. We can put them in the report. We can make sure they're at the desk of the commission. They may not go into the official problem statement, but they will be included in the report. So we're not going to lose any of these important conversations. Um, they may just be parked in another place as we progress through our structured decision making here. Yeah, um, just so back up a little bit to purpose of committee. Um, do you have that slide or not? I mean, we all have our feet paper, but anyways, um, if it's public sounds actually related to line winter opportunity. So just going off that, I'm gonna say that no matter what going forward, line winter opportunity is the first purpose of this committee. Am I correct? And then we're going to look at line conflict and under population trends. And those three things we'll deal with in our part of it. Okay. I'm seeing a nod from, from Brian. 
Yeah, I didn't hear could you repeat that? So I'm just I'm just going to the very basic here that um public satisfaction related line hunting opportunities okay is the purpose of this committee. So going forward, um Deshaun was asking if we were looking at the lions. I'm using that chart saying no or not. I'm am I correct? Those are the three things that are in my brain going forward. It's lion hunter opportunity, lion conflict, and hunger population. Those are the three things that, for the purpose of this committee, yep. um, you're trying to maximize that. Okay. So yep. there's going to be trade-offs. Okay. That, so we're not, to answer the question, are we charged yeah. with the animals, or how do you bring that? The lions won't be able to. Yeah, do you want a healthy cat population, or are you just trying to make a healthy deer population? About yeah. So, um, go back to that. And so, I guess then further, are you trying, trying to, to create level. better cat hunting opportunities for everyone, or are you trying to create better deer and elk hunting opportunities for everyone, or are you just trying to have a healthy and sustainable cat population? And deciding how that impacts those other things. I think that that is implicit. It's not explicit here, but but that's certainly a consideration as a help. The, the relative health of, of, of the lion population is not hope it would be, because otherwise, like, you're not going to have cats, and then you won't have your hunting opportunity. It's like, it seems like if you want to hunt cats, you want a healthy cat population, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gets the Public satisfaction related to hunter opportunity. Yeah. So the hunter opportunity is predicated on the, the health mm -hmm. of that lion population. So, you know, there are some people um, who, you know, hunter opportunity, public satisfaction it might be, I'm the only guy in the woods. For somebody else, it might be, I'm hunting my tail off and there is not a single lion in the woods. So, you know, it, it runs the gamut. So that mm -hmm. is part of part of the discussion. It is not helpful to describe all these different challenges, right, in this problem statement. And when we get to the next step of defining objectives, we can make all those different considerations explicit so that then when we get to the later analysis phase, we can see the trade offs of you know, each of those different objectives and how well they can. Have questions? <laughs> I was just about these guys that have the over objective elk areas. Is that mostly because of the private land? I mean, there's a lot of private land in the area, like over by Lewistown and the Wilkes Brother. I mean, you got all that huge herd. Are you counting those that number for over objective, or are those actually huntable elk? Or... I'm in the northern sapphires, so it's, it's like, like hunting region 204. 204. So, uh, some of it's private land, a lot of it's public land. Uh, we've seen a, a large increase in cow elk numbers. Is that um, statistics? I mean, fish and wildlife statistics? Or yeah, we make some accounts to those aerial surveys. So, like, we were winter elk habitat for like 250 elk in 2009. Currently, we're featuring five to six hundred. Are those um, migrating elk? Or they, just... they do move around. Yeah, actually, they, they did a northern sapphire elk research project to track migration. And yeah, they're not just yarding up in one spot. They do move around quite a bit. And all of that's like, I think, on it, it's like, in my experience, it seems like everywhere that's over objective, is, it's usually a lot of private land. Yeah, there's some big chunks of private land there, but it's huntable private. It's just not a free for all. So, like, yeah. every day of the hunting season, inclusive of early and late shoulder seasons, there are hunters on those private lands. And that is one of the factors on. The ones I'm familiar with, it's uh, there is large landowners, but also, you know, there's so many tags that you got two sections of uh, public access, and there's 400 people there. So, yeah. elk aren't gone, they better move until they quit being bothered. Yeah. 
seems like it's regional with the problems that yeah. everybody's having. I mean, we got a great habitat too, right? Yeah. So like there's, there's food and water, like they want to be there. It's a great spot for them. Um, and then of course, then we see that the cats want to be there too. Yeah. But we do have like, we have a cat population that is like quite dense compared to all the numbers that we're looking at here. And they are surely not eating themselves out of house and home. Like they're not putting it in in the near and out populations, and they're not the largest contributing factor to mortality in either of those populations. If you you feel if you doubled the quota there, it would impact the cat population at all for cats. I mean, you reckon? I think. You think? Like, I think like what I'm looking what at two o two. Yep, two o two. It's two o four. It's the is the deer district anyway, but like or the elk elk deer district, but like. There's a ton of birthers that move through. So you've got a lot of young cats just passing through and, and there's tons of them. And if you went after them, you're, you, you can hunt all of them and you're not really gonna screw up the resident population at all. Um, but it's one like, what I see is like the most abruptive thing that you should do is pull out the territorial females that have like have an established place because when you pull them out, then it's like a vacuum, and then you just get whatever in there and it changes the whole dynamic. But we see the adult male disappear every year. If an adult male lasts a few years, it's kind of a miracle. So they get hunted every year, every two years they're gone, we get new genetics, and that doesn't seem to disrupt stuff too much. And all those dispersers, if they get pulled out, they don't seem to disrupt the problem too much. So like, in terms of hunting opportunity, you could go after those guys, but like it's the adult females that seem to create the greatest disruption in the population when they get pulled out. I think well, it looks like I don't know exactly. It looks like if there's eight is all on the quota for this for 2023. Four that female, area. four males in that area. I think two of two or four. He said. Yeah, I think it just depends on which. I don't know what it was that. last year. They raised it. But, I mean, adult female have what three kittens. Yeah, one to four. Yeah, they depend on the population. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we see like survival rates vary depending upon where those territories are and what the prey base is in those territories. So you'll see like some females that don't have the best hunting territory, like one out of every four surviving. Females that have better hunting are like, you know, three, four maybe out of every four. But then they don't make it, you know, more than, you know, one of those will make it to three yeah. years old. You know. The biology here, do you have any? What's that? Other oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> You don't have the data on like the age on those, do you? I mean, two or four ones? Do you have any? I could get it. I, you don't have the data. I was just curious. On the I, think, hills, I think it's really hard when we go from species to species to species. 204 is my backyard. I've been there for over 20 years. That's where I hunt. Every year I see less mule deer. Elk numbers may be going up, but our mule deer just aren't what they were. Well, some of that is because of the elk Because, well, whatever. I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a, like I said, I've chased lions for a good part of my life. Uh, love lions, uh, love hounds, but I also like, you know, I like to see everything else. So that's going to be the hard part is quantifying what we're going to be able to live with. What the effect is going to be on the animal population? So that's going to be your age class, you know. You want to pull out all the big cats, yeah. then you leave the little cats, and they're going to hammer your deer. So the big cats are going to be able to go after, like you know, cow or spiked bull. And so if you pull all the ones out, you're going to try to go after those, and then what's left over is going to be all the deer. So I'm going to pause this here because what we're doing now is starting to get into that later stage of this where we're talking about alternatives, what to do. And today, today, our singular focus, and this is really frustrating, is just saying what the problem is. So um, we're going to stick with that a little longer and, and wait to get into this important discussion. And we'll have to do it. Um, so we want to show that
<laughs> Think about one more minute to just wrap up your thoughts, and we're going to break into groups and you guys discuss. So as the next step, instead of hearing from us, we want to get you guys into small groups so you can talk to each other. We're going to break into four groups. We'll have one group here, one group on this side of the table, one group on that side of the table, and one group out there. And what we'll do is uh, we'll have one of our uh, staff members here be your note taker. So they can write things up for you if you want, or if you want to be in charge of the laptop, you can do that. They're there you're at your disposal if you want to. So why don't we do uh, one, two, three? You guys will be over here. And then uh, one, two, three. You guys will be kind of right here at this side of the table. Uh, you got three, three. So I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, one, two, three. And then one, two, three. You guys will be this. Actually, you guys will be out there. 
and then do four and just stay right where you're at. Goal is to try to come up with one of these problems stayed in front of a group. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I 
By this committee's recommendation, the 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 if you had an opportunity to correct it, this will be done. The leader well, I'll experience it. I'll experience it. Yeah, 
They're going to set the season again next spring. Just to make sure that monitoring to see what they're doing. So now it's kind of a down. Yeah, I think those are the triggers. People, right? And then the action here. And we're going to get some restored. Lower some. Yeah, like three to four. They raised it. No, like three in September. Yeah, areas don't even make paper. So, like, seven areas. I think this more actually All over the thing Right. 
about 20 minutes and we've got lunch half an hour lunch we'll come back and keep working on it so uh cody john and trent you want to walk us through what you have here you can read it or uh just talk us through it um i think that first one's mine uh, i think it's kind of a up or down it seems like plans pretty much are, in my opinion over regulated um, as the angulants go down, they blame it on the lands. As the angulants go up, different approach. They try to increase, the, lower the floor to get more lands in the area. I think it's an overmanaged species. Um, 
with that being said, I don't think we should not manage them, but I think that I almost feel if you you're trying to manage for a big region, so you break it down into smaller parts. So you have one canyon where all the lions are, you know, they're all going to get killed. So why not open the areas up, put 25 in this big area, they're going to take the problem ones where they're the easiest to get, and you're still going to have uh, more opportunities. But um, I take a stab turning that into SGM problem language. <laughs> so <laughs> the problem that I'm hearing is that um, it's we we need the tools to manage mountain lines more precisely, but we are stuck managing at an eco regional level. Right. Is that, that yep. fair characterization? Yep. Anything else this group wants to add? Can we maybe uh, move the so the rest of this can read what's or are you just focusing on the top part right now? We're, yeah, we're just looking oh. looking at group one now, and we'll we'll scroll down. When <clears throat> you're done reading these two paragraphs, I think I don't know. Move this down. Can we comment on this? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, well, I was just looking at the road access there. Um, as they probably found out last winter, the study goes back to forest management. The little belts are so covered with blowdowns that, you know, majority of the roads that technically are open, you get a chainsaw with half a day to get through there. Did you guys run into some of that? No. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> they just want to, yeah. I mean, it's thick enough. Some spots, the dogs only can go through it. So. Kind of along those lines for us is how, I guess, mm -hmm. the direct line management in areas that weren't just the easy cats. And, you know, some of that is like Trent said, you know, too much access, you know, decreases elk deer numbers. Maybe lions aren't there for that reason. Other areas where we want to target lion harvest for sheep concerns or other ungulate focal areas, and the Forest Service is closing off these roads, so nobody's going to just walk in there now. How are we going to direct lion management to certain areas that? Don't normally get a get hit, or or how do you force line hunters to go in areas where quotas aren't met? There's a couple ones that I'll just point to here is really good examples of SDM style problem statements. So one is we can increase the quota, but it's difficult to fill if access is difficult. We're not presenting a solution there, we're just stating the problem. And one right after that, we'd like to see a robust lion population as well as a robust ungulate populations, but it's difficult to balance. I think that reflects some of what I've heard from the group pretty well. So. Those are good examples of how to frame the problem without jumping ahead to the alternatives. With no solution. We're not there yet. <laughs> that, yeah, we've got time for that. Yes, that's yes. a classic problem. Here we are. Jump, jump to the solution, but we, we want to avoid doing that. Solve the thing yeah. right. <laughs> We're just trying to figure out what the problem is first, and that's hard. Deceptively simple. Deceptively complicated. Pass it to the second group. See what you guys have. We're all we, we didn't get much. No, we're all important. But I think that's what it would be. 
group one said in Sudeik or you know that big of an area, there's problems all over the place and issues all over the place. So Is this your yeah plan? Somebody want to give us the little Cliff Notes version here? That is. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had three different ideas. I mean, three different stuff. I mean, one was you no, know, mine was. It's more of a social. It's a social issue as far as you know, and we were. I guess the two of us in the same area, it was, it was, we have a different maybe situation than what other people see around the state as far as outfitters versus general hunters and discussion with all right and raised quotas. And you know, we don't have any issues really with the outfitters in our area, with the outfitter in our area. We don't want to, you know, as far as conflicts and stuff like that go. Um, like I said, Man Cat was got last year. You know, just, one of those things, but at the same time, you start mismanaging harvest numbers and quotas and things like that. I think it leads to more potential conflicts as far as um, general Joe Blows going out there, like myself, that are out there and that have dogs in one of but at the same time, competing with outfitters and having hiring more guys and doing this and that. And it's more of a social conflict than a actual health of population or ungulate population or anything like that, just a different type of issue that was brought up. Potential, not current potential. Yeah, uh, one thing we mentioned kind of, I guess, if to, to sum it up is when you have high quotas in certain areas and they don't get filled, we have a lot of new town guys um, in the Jefferson Valley and th those younger generation and we probably all did it um are not going to be mindful of the age structure of the cap um so we kind of all of us in the area typically don't shoot any young subadult juvenile type cats that often but but new hound guys typically the first cat they get in the tree they're excited to shoot it so to sum that up we're talking about age structure um and which is really all the, the ethics of the guy running the dogs. And then going forward, um, Josh was talking like, hey, if you take a bit, if you increase an area um, back to the big, bigger LMUs and the quota then goes much higher, um, does that mean that the outfitters can now take a bunch more hunters, creating more conflict? So just thoughts, ideas. No, I think we're no, all in agreement that we want healthy cat populations and healthy deer and populations. And we're, I guess it seems like where we are, those are different areas. We're seeing both of those are actually okay. Um, so we're not seeing a, a dire need to make adjustments. And the concern, of course, is that there's not quite enough information. So to go tinkering with the system in too great a way, uh, you you're introducing more variables into a system that you don't have quite enough information to know what you're going to end up with. So our takeaway was probably more to just not make any major adjustments. Yes. Next group. Yes. When we've heard a couple of these before, I mean, it's basically we want to manage lions for hunting opportunity for lions. We want to manage yeah. lions for ungulate hunting opportunity on a sustainable level. And again, we also hear that eco region wise, what we have to focus on as a charge of you know of our of our committee, but you know to have that variability, the flexibility to look at LMUs uh, as far as the you know targeting. Uh, I guess problem areas or super high, you know, uh, line density areas. Uh, to leave that, you know, kind of flexible as far as setting quota system.
I hit on um, the public perception um, and to all creditors right now, but um, I don't be sure I am what we're talking about today, but uh, that if we can do somehow um, educate the general hunting population, the general population that doesn't factor into it, that doesn't come for online. But um, if we could just educate them, teaching the, the, the value of the land, ne positively and negatively, um, that's a big, there's a big void in there where people just don't understand the value of them out there. Right? But um, we also had a little bit of a uh, conflict with the large eco region side and maybe not being able to target cats properly that need to be targeted. The structured approach. And in a way, echo everybody else. You know, <laughs> we just have better writer. <laughs> so once again i'll try to reflect back what i'm hearing from you guys and tell me if this sounds like what you're saying and if i'm i'm missing anything so i i kind of heard four issues come up the first one was the balance between ungulate and lion populations um the second one is this issue of uncertainty that makes making these recommendations inherently difficult and maybe even problematic. The third is complexity, that this is an eco-region problem, but it needs precision solutions that are difficult to do, uh, and sometimes involve uh, ecological questions like age structure that we don't understand as well as we could. And then the fourth one that I heard is just generally the public. There's competing public interests and perceptions around this issue that all uh, are important to factor in. What did, what did I miss and is any of that wrong? I think it's right. I think another one is, is the social versus biological. Is, um, you know, like the line numbers of socially, what do, what, what do people want to see on the land? Biologically, that's completely different. Well, it doesn't really matter. And there is a ungulate focal point, points, points um, obviously would, but you, you can manage low, high, short term, and then long term, you know, it doesn't make a difference. So it is kind of a social, social uh, issue, really. Here, what do you think? I think this is off to a great start. Yeah. Um, we'll on it some more over lunch. Talk about it over lunch a little bit more amongst yourselves and keep going after, after that. Do I get lunch? Reconvene at 1230. You got five extra minutes. Great. <laughs>
All right, folks, we're ready to start again. So hopefully everyone had a great lunch, feels revived, refreshed, ready to get back to work. Uh, plan now is more of the same. So we're going to send you out into your same groups. We'd like you to revise those statements that you made um, and see if you can work toward a little more formal version this time. It'll take another 20 or 30 minutes to try to get there. Uh, last time was really great for me. That's great. Let's see if this time we can take a step toward articulating a problem statement. And remember, the problem is about what the tensions are, what the challenges are, without necessarily getting into those alternatives or solutions or actions that we're gonna take. So um, yeah, you can go back to the same places you were, the same note takers you had. Um, Alex is gonna take over for the group that was working with Justin, but otherwise, um, let's take about 20 or 30 minutes to try this again. Can you put an example? Yeah. Yeah. So we can have an example of this. Uh, so we do, yeah. Yeah.
And for that act, I was thinking something over lunch there, you know, I was like, get out for both sides, you know, like, you know, like, what we did to update recording and the last three book that we that that was in Wyoming. Uh, yeah, I'm just going by Wyoming. You know, Wyoming is a locality for us. Exactly. So the formula is yeah. 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 Oh, oh. it's run going Yeah, it's taken out. It's the most it's the most most yeah. It's the most yeah. And then the it's the most 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 Here's the one that I have the trouble with, and I have first hand experience. I love seeing it. Is okay. So you build those out, smoke the line, get some that food when you need. It's not a cold. Mark, you decide to drop the dime on the bill. First thing that happens is I'm just paraphrasing. Uh, first thing happens is we're going to take the deadline to deadline. In my and in region four, story, the Hickey Bay there's only been eight lifestyle I that's whatever. Yeah, whatever mountain lions have, there's a joke in there somewhere.
So what we're going to do now is um, we're just going to put these up one by one. We're going to let you read through them. Um, then we can discuss, but our goal at the end of this is to maybe look for one that we can kind of anchor on and then look at the others to add anything that might be missing from that one. So let's read through them one at a time and see if there's one that captures most of the group, uh, group thinking here. Folks from this group want to add anything or other folks have questions? Great. Let's scroll to the next. All right. Oh, so is this it? Yeah, this is group one. I think this is it too. Oh, sure. yeah. That's from this group. Questions from others? Okay. The next one. Group three, anything to add? Imitate. Well, okay, so uh, how do you manage age class? Is is fish and game have a specific age class in mind that they would like to be? Um, how do you, how do you target? How do you do that? Anybody have an answer to that? Is there a specific age class in mind that the fish and game would like to see taken? We can take a quick answer and then it's 
Quick quick answer is no, we do not have a specific data type in mind. We don't know how to do that. We can target the text. I just said that. I mean, we can give you an idea of the text. Yes. I think from the review, you just can't shoot a spotted kitten, right? right? Basically, that's it. That's your bar on it, too. That's right. <laughs> that's your age class. The discussion, though, with regulation, I know how it was structured that they go open for it. Permit system is under more time to be selected and quite expansive about uh, each one. It's a little bit theoretical. Yeah. But that's regularly. Report. You guys would just like Jad. It seemed to be all quite different. <laughs> yeah. We went to the word. So they're common. So what do we do from here? We kind of try to combine these four. Do we look at commonalities between group one, two, three, four? Is that what we try to do? And ultimately come up with one. That's the goal, yeah. The, the path of least resistance, what we did last time was pick one of the four statements that got the closest and then work as a full group to get it where we want it to be. Not everyone has to agree with everything, but we all have to kind of settle on this is the best version of the problem statement. But yeah, by the end of the day, we want just one. Statement. We start over and pick what the most common theme out of each one, I don't know. Yeah. Rather than pick maybe one particular one, unless whatever seems so thinking multiple different ones. Yeah. Yeah. One thing we could do is if there's one that kind of grabs the US closer than the others, we can put that on one side of the screen, then I can put up each of the others and we can take pieces, any sentences or parts that are missing and just uh, throw them in different ways. Use the, the one we want to work off of. For instance, I feed it. The, the desire to micromanage a little smaller, smaller in the <laughs> eco region. Like take those similarities out of each one and make it make it harder. Yeah, I think we can we can scroll through them again. I, I think the easiest way will be to see if there's one that we're happy to kind of start with just as a baseline and then edit that as a group. But if, if the answer is we're not happy with any of these as a group, then yeah, we can we can start fresh. But maybe we can scroll through again and see if there's uh, ones that uh, I call out to us. So we can vote one, two, three, and four. What's our favorite? And we go we can do a vote. Yeah, I, I agree to them, and I think they're. I don't know that I love any one of them. You know, putting, yeah. but I, I like parts of several of them, okay. and I think there's some definite commonalities between um, all of them in a lot of ways. And I think that's why I was thinking maybe doing a start over and picking out of each one, but I don't know, whatever. I'll stop talking. Let's take another scan through. 
see if uh, any more discussion comes up as we look. The there, I think it's on pretty much takes a little bit of everybody. Maybe one, one vote for group two. <laughs> we'll hang on to that. Yeah, we'll go through it. the rest before we decide. I think group two might vote for group two. <laughs> <laughs> Well, be candid with you. You know, you keep asking, why are we here? What's the determining factor? You know, I don't know how your guys' lives work, but I'm always a half a day late and an hour behind. And I might think that the interstate speed limit should be 100 miles an hour, but it's not. It's 80. And if I violate that, I violated the law. That annotated code that I keep going back to, that is what the commission has to base its decision on. You can think we need this, you can think we need that, but what does the actual codified code say? And it specifically states that we will manage predators to the benefit of deer, elk, moose, sheep, animal, and goats. Doesn't talk about anything else. That's the law of Montana. I would love to see this speed limit on the interstate be 90 miles an hour because it might get somewhere on time. But that's not the case. That's not annotated code. So did that directly go to the elk management plan? So see, that's yeah, you keep bringing the elk management plan up. What I, I understand the elk management plan isn't. It. Give me the mule deer area in Montana that is over objective because I'm 40, 341. Okay, those three. That's why I think they need to. I agree with you in this respect. We don't need a broad based approach that's wrong, but we need to be able to be specific and we can target certain areas to bring these things up. That's what, that's what they're mandated by that annotated code to do. Um, Is it about having a core system for lines managing our predator? It, it, it is managing a predator, except for when you start going though. Was it who was telling me that the how many goat tags they gave a few years ago? It was a hundred. Which one of you gentlemen was telling me? Uh, well, yeah, it used yeah. to be a hundred and bitter, now it's one. Yeah, the seventies there was a hundred goat tags in the in the west side of the bitterness. And by the time I do a tag in the eighties, there was fifty. So fifty the next year went to nine. Now it's one. Is that to do with mountain lions or to do with all um, You know, I've done a lot of scanning. That's what I did. I was, I was a commercial beekeeper, how I made my living. So I might work 80 hours a week from March to October and then I hunted for other beekeeper. And when I wasn't hunting, I was skinning in a taxidermy shop, making forms, that kind of stuff. But you'd be surprised how many pieces of goat horn, or how many, yeah, how many pieces of goat horn we picked out of line over the years. My theory, and, and, the, and the goat population is going down because, like we talked about, uh, identifying sex and age. When you take a nanny out of a goat herd, you're killing a, a lot more goats than one. And that was always a problem in the bitter. But also, 
from my experience with chasing lions and skinning and stuff, when we got the wolves in, that pushed a lot of those big toms up. They couldn't compete with the wolves. They were getting harassed. They went up where they could live, just like they were talking about some lions targeting sheep. I think there's some lions targeting goats. And goats are a really, really small population. And it doesn't take a lot of them to put them on a downhill slide. So my theory, I don't know whether it's BS or whether it's true or not, but that was my take on it. Well, if you get one cat that gets really good at killing goats, I mean, that, that one cat is not really like cats generally. Well, and like I said, we've had cats and goats forever. Yeah. Uh, but something something changed in that population in the last 40 years. And I'm curious, too, with the, like, managing for this particular code. I think everyone here is in agreement that we would like more deer and elk because we all like to hunt deer and elk. And I think... A lot of people in this room want healthy cat populations because they want to have cats in the landscape and they want to be able to have hunting opportunities or it's their business as an outfit or whatever it can be. So I don't like, I don't like, are we in disagreement around that? Because I think we're trying to come up with a plan that checks that box while also taking into account the health of the mountain lion population because it's an important ingredient in what we're trying to accomplish today. My off base, or does that? I, I don't think they're off base at all. I think Evans had more of this right on the money. Yes, so I think we're kind of in, in agreement on that. Yeah, yeah. The biggest limiting factor here is we're not allowed to talk about the real deal. There's, this should not be a meeting about mountain lions. <laughs> you can't talk, we can't exactly. talk about the elephant right? because they get sued when we're talking about wolves. You know, they get sued. You can't even mention a grizzly bear, you can't mention this other stuff. And Single species management does not work. It's a fallacy. You haven't addressed coyotes. Mule deer populations and coyotes is huge. Well, I think you speak strongly to the complexity of the issue and the, the fact that there's gaps in our understanding, gaps maybe in the data and what we're able to uh, address, but we're also limited in the scope of what we're trying to accomplish today. We have to just stay in our lane and have it. I don't know if everybody can read that. Maybe you or Sarah can read through that. But that's the legislation or whatever. It's like that one. Everybody in the group can. Yeah. So just with respect to the complexity and the things that we we can't make a decision about today, we can include those in the report and make sure to flag that this group thinks you know multi-species uh, approach is really important. We do want to end our our mission with coming up with a mountain lion recommendation, but we can be sure to include those kinds of ideas uh, in what we share with the commission. Just wanted to make that clear. I was thinking of picking on an easy target. And the only target we can use. It's the only target they gave us. Yes. But it is our only option, right? I mean, it's so not like, okay, <laughs> well, we're going to pick up, we're going to pick on these guys, and it's something that we, I mean, obviously there's a lot of ecological stuff and they just stuff and all that stuff that's pretty honestly we're some guys that enjoy spending time in the outdoors and want to make sure that multiple species are preserved and taken care of um but no it just seems like we're given yeah we're given very just limited it's so many just hamstrung in so many different ways on Making decisions on that bit. Really good for us. We're going to
uh, and maybe I may make it to compare. So it seems like at least the most towns in there, I'm not saying all of them. There seems to be a little hesitation going into this large equity um, management. Um, after what we've been through the last 30 years and establishing the core system and stuff. And it's really hard to wrap your head around this change all it's not all of a sudden obviously you guys have been working on it for a long time, but for us it is it's going to go from the quota system to this large management scheme. And it's hard to wrap your head head around it. And and I have to work hesitant to change anything because throughout my 33 years of chasing cats, I've seen some serious mistakes in quota uh, in, in being low or high, but uh, as an overall goal with the quota system, I think it works for the course of time. And so I don't know, I don't see where the big, what's the big hurry in doing this in such a short time? Changing this off in just a such a short time. So I'm a little ahead of it all. Can I ask you about that thing? So are you saying that the uh the switch to the eco region management is change enough in and of itself that additional changes beyond that seem like too much change? Or I think just the change um I know there needs to be a broader understanding of the lines on the landscape, but I don't know. It seems to me with the administration we have right now that everything is just getting hammered through. And can we just take a step back, take a breath, and spend more time doing all this stuff? You know, because this seems to me to be a quick change. Considering that the last thirty years we've been pretty much the status quo, I think it's still have forward. It's still have yeah, 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 still have yeah, still have forward. Still, it's going to be way different, way different. So I'm just just saying, it seems like also not permanent, right? I mean, it seems like it yeah, you get everything gets getting pushed it through. Yeah, I my. Re reaction to that is that, um, be that as it may, we've kind of come together to address right. this particular charge, and I, I would be concerned we just couldn't really do much as a group to reflect that, other than to note it and include it as another of these issues that we want to be sure to flag for the commission. So we'll we right. can definitely take that down and put it in the parking lot. But I mean, here we are. We got to try yeah. to go yeah. here and exactly. figure out is it going to be beneficial to increase quotas, leave the same, or decrease them. And then we can make that recommendation. That is going to be a hard, hard game of us. I mean, there's not as much as we would love to do all this stuff and really focus on all the predators and whatever. Um, that's not what it has to do, right? And then we don't even have that as an option. So, well, I think we've all, all the groups of, from our first breakout session, all of us had something on there about. One, the complexity of this, right? This multi species approach. But we also had on there, uh, every, all the groups, right? Our preferences take this eco region. It's really hard for us. Some areas are, are, are good, some of them are overlying, populated, right? So to have a, be able to have the flexibility to focus on targeted LMUs as far as increasing code quotas. Or reducing quotas depending on the LMU itself, right? I, mean, I think we all had something in there, um, right? As far as one of our constraints, it was free. So having looked at all these again, <laughs> so do feel like that we start over? <laughs> do we feel like, yeah? Well, that's the question, right? Do we want to yeah. kind of build on one of these, or do we want to start from scratch based on this discussion? Anybody have thoughts on that they'd like to share? Pick one. I vote for we go with group two suggestions and then pull out what you don't like and add in what you do. Are we, why don't we take two? a vote? <laughs> 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 I like 
So that's the move that's fine. That's right. To yeah, get yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Like, if there's stuff in there you don't like, but you could probably do that with any one of them. Like, throw it in. They all have such similar elements, right? I mean, totally. we're, we're wanting a balance across ungulates and lines. Yeah, we're we're wanting some flexibility with um, with targeting different LMUs for increased, decrease, or, or stable population. Yeah, I think it's right. Board. So I mean, we have a lot of commonalities. It's just written in vastly different ways. Yeah, I think really that's all it boils down to is just semantics. So that being said, so, let's just start over and pick common points out of each one. Yeah. The start There's the a whole middle of this yeah. section. I've been reading this. The whole middle of this is talking about stuff that we can't even do anything about. That's stuff that could maybe go in the parking lot if it's not. Yeah, yeah that's kind of. I mean, let's focus on that's what I was thinking about. This study is well written, and there's some good stuff in here. Um, we're trying to make a decision with a blunt tool. I mean, yeah, we we got some marginal information we're trying to deal with, and. You know, so we all know that, but that's all we have. We have so we're that's where we're working from. Um, we need something more precise, yeah, in a perfect world, but we don't have that. So, uh, certain matters, yeah. yeah, I like that. So, yeah, the first statement's great, and there's a lot of stuff in the middle. I just think is redundant. We talked about we can't do anything about, we're not asked to do anything about it, it's just. Maybe bending, I don't know. What but it is it? stuff that's a concern for a lot of It is for sure. So, so, sorry. I know it's it's stuff that's it's not, we're not tasked with dealing with it and it's beyond what we can accomplish, but it is stuff that maybe is like passing it down the line. Yeah. It'd be nice to have it like in the margins or in the exactly. that exactly that you're talking about. Yeah, there's tons of that. There's tons yeah. of that. So making a section like we can deal with the stuff that like this is what we're actually tasked with. Let's hammer yeah. away at that. And then there's all the extras, yeah. extras yeah. that we're yeah. 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 we can we can try to like that or this. We can throw that in there. So and that's all I just you know just to move it along. I I I agree 100 percent I'm not I'm not so shooting yeah. on that. So we can cut and paste that would be there, right there. There, there we go. I've got this to say said very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Two hundred answers. <laughs> well, there's a there's a, we make a subsection in that that's yeah. like the parking lot zone. Yeah. I'm gonna ask if there's things you want to pull out of this before we add from the other statements. I want to keep in the statement. This in the middle. We want healthy cat populations. We want healthy deer and elk populations. I would change that to ungulate. Yeah. Um, and we want to address as best we can the interplay between these making decisions. That address that. I think that's, I think we that's all good. Be, that's a perfect statement. Yeah. yeah. My thing. Can I ask a question? Maybe process related that may help the question. This question maybe we're actually going to be Brian. <clears throat> Brian. It's the Whitley. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> you got a problem. But uh, you wanted the. The group is charged with, you know, target population trend. Mm -hmm. Do does the group have to decide on a on a trend overall for the entire eco region, or if the group decided could they decide if you know we want to see population decrease in a certain report in a certain area of the eco region, stability in a certain portion increase, or or is it all one way or or the other? You know, so. We look at the eco region overall because we think of that as kind of the area that we're trying to manage that population. We kind of think of that as trying to affect it overall. But you certainly have the ability to, to look at focus areas. And we don't really define you know, how big an area of focus area could be. So if you were, I mean, <clears throat> You know, there's a variety you could say we want it to increase by 10%, but in the east, we want it to focus area that we actually want it to decrease. Or you could say we want it stable, we want it to decrease in the west, and we want it to increase in the east. You know, it, it's you have part of your charge is to pick the focal areas. Focal areas for us uh, work best if we're looking at kind of the lion management unit uh, basis because. Then we can we can focus that harvest of those quotas in those areas. But 
it's it's not defined anywhere, and it's up to the uh, the committee to kind of define what that focus area would be. And so I would say you've got a lot of flexibility. So we should include a statement about that then, right? Like if we all want kind of that flexibility. We don't want to say ecosystem wide we need to increase quota. Period. I mean, if we, I think we've all said that. Like we need more focused. As far as specific management mm -hmm. areas, mm -hmm. well, right. so we should have a statement in there about that. How will you? How will you uh, do that? I mean, how will you uh, change the quota in a certain area? I mean, is that just by um, counting it or how are you going to manage that? How are you going to do that? Yeah. So what we've done so far is, if we're looking to get the eco region to go in a particular direction. Um, <clears throat> what we have is a estimated number that has some degree of certainty around that that we will improve upon over time. But with that number, if we want the eco region to go down by, you know, in the last I'll just use the example for the last eco region. Um, the group wanted to see it reduce 12% in the next six years. And so we can look at in that area how many lines of, and what the sex ratio needs to be in order to get that population to do what the, what the group had wanted, looking primarily at point estimates. <clears throat> but then the, uh, the group wanted to say on this focus area, We'd actually like to see harvest increase here. In this part of the area, we haven't been able to achieve quotas, so it's probably unrealistic to think we're going to increase harvest there. And here's another place we'd like to see the increase. And so then, since we can't increase here, we'll subtract that out of the out of the map because we want to increase here and here more. We'll add more to those areas, and then we look at it as an overall. And so that's you know just a real quick and dirty one yeah. yeah. how we do that. But if we're using the, the integrated population model to, to run the scenarios. Gotcha. One of the groups, I think it was group four, had a mission of the LMUs. So we've got that pulled up here. We can use that or edit that as you guys see fit. Yeah. Is that in the list of things that were not to be done by the review, though? Yeah. This, I know. <laughs> we'll defer to uh, Justin and Brian here, but I think we can make emphases but not set specific numbers. Is that correct? Right. Right. So, the way it worked last time, what we did was we got the direction to the committee. Uh, the focal areas were for deer now. That they were worried about. For the most part, there was some big more cheese they wanted to share. So they that was what they said. In these areas, we want higher harvest and reduce mining. And they did provide overall direction on the, the trend that they'd like to see in the whole ecoregion for the lion population. And then we took it back, like Brian said, we said we determined how many needed to be harvested to achieve that trend, and then we allocated where that harvest would go in the LMUs in order to accomplish the overall trend direction and the specific emphasis area that they identified for us. And we presented that to them at the second meeting. So it wasn't like we were kind of doing that. The biologists presented several options for how that would look. And then, so it's kind of a mix of you know what we did and what the committee did. Okay. I was just thinking of that. Yeah, there was there was like the last line on that. Um, what is the committee here to do specifically? Said not to set quotas for LMC. So I I'm, I'm trying to make sure I you know I because I want to make sure I understand yeah. that. Too. I could change the emphasis, or maybe put FWP needs to decide on quotas. Or suggestion. <clears throat> we took out quotas of the population with that. 
that's what we're supposed to be focusing on in the population, not the quotas. Right. Mm -hmm. Should we take the line hunting, take hunting out and just use line population as overall? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. If folks want to move that. It's already in the second spot. We had started to type parking lots. Were there things from this that you want to pull out before we go back to the other um, other examples yeah. that we've written up and look for more to add? <laughs> so what, I just, can I interject something biological here for that first sentence the way to read now? The reason we switch to eco regions is you guys have talked about it several times that mountain lion populations they operate at an enormous scale. So there isn't really a population of mountain lions that are telling you that that's kind of a that's all because whatever happens in LMU is very temporary. I mean, you get lions coming in there from a long way off. Like we could wipe out all of the lions in an LMU, and we did this as a, an experiment, a research project once. We took it down to very low density in the Garnets, and within three years, it was back to where it was. And that's because they dispersed a long way. Like the scale of the population is just bigger than the scale of the population of the big game. So, it, it, the way that it reads now is that you want to determine the population print for each LMU. That's a little off, you know what I mean? Like you can affect the density of each LMU, but the population trend, you need to think bigger scale just because that's how nominally you work, if that makes sense. So, you know, there's just something off biologically about that. Okay, but in the line that's where the LMU stuff came from, I was, I don't know that it was specifically LMU, it was more like, they got to get going on the river. Yeah. Yeah. We're not seeing here. Oh yeah, yeah for you sure. know what I mean. Like I, I so, like, so how do then now two thousand two? I think hey, you're making decisions on such a huge area. I get that's a little bigger, but it's more of what they got going on. That I just gotta see the cat and bull or foot has been shown in the house. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not sure about that because we've had compromises. Okay, I've caught cats that have been tagged. And they're they're all in that yeah. purpose. Yeah. 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 It's my idea. It's my idea. We're going to change. The point is, yes, I know they travel, but they have a, they have local issues, and I think that it was For sure. maybe it's not LMUs. Maybe it's I need to find a local issue. Yeah. You know, like like our region is what we see like in our region. Really it's it's upset. No, I'm so good. Like, but that looks like how do you get some more control in those areas? Do you know what I mean? Those What's well, a better way to put it for those yeah. automatic areas? I think seriously, let's call them under like focal points. Uh, there in line that need to uh, that software instead of to decide on line density trends for each LMU, we say to decide on line density trends for like a geographic subset within the larger eco region. Well, it, works. it is, but it makes it more local, so you can yeah. deal with the local issues, yeah, and that. it's not just the LMU. Yes. In parts of the region, yeah, within the greater eco region or whatever. And then it just gives you a little bit of the flexibility to deal with localized issues. Like if you're just seeing your deer and elk trends are terrible in one area and you want to address that, you have flexibility to do that. And definitely the last statement, the parentheses, I mean, higher quotas where our units are struggling, the stable were defined, lower where our units are over. That's as far as the management thereof, you know, of, of setting the quotas and stuff. It's out of our hands, but that's what the focus should be on within the eco region, right? I mean, that's, I think that says what we needed to say. Sarah asked a good question earlier that I think went unheard, which is, are there other parts of this that we need to take out 
to put into the parking lot. Well, the age class thing. If we need the age class, probably can't actually do it. Well, okay. It's just something our, at our local Halloween with our biologists, it's something they've been bringing up a lot that they're concerned about and they want to see the thing that keeps showing us charts and defining the age class. And that would be cats that are harvested with increasing and increasing gas yeah. and so forth. There's probably not, that's mm -hmm. probably not the spot for it. Yeah. 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 I'll put this in the parking lot for now. Yeah. 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 Would it be possible to then with the action portion, because the the focus there again, like is clearly we're managing cats for deer and elk. Could we throw in a clause that is also that we're managing them for the health of the mountain lion population in and of itself? Because you want to have a healthy mountain lion population. I don't know what that number is, is that right? No, but you don't want to go out there and crash it. But we also don't want to be in it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's kind of, well, there, that kind of, I guess, points it like we want the data, right? All so right. you would like to, to have a, a better understanding of where those populations are. In every region, too. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Thank you. We might have a different thing going on. Absolutely. Yes. It's hard to find. I don't know why. You know, part of it because on the left side is all you go straight up in the wilderness into Idaho. And those, you can't kill those cats back. You can kill as many as you want, and then you can kill any Idaho. Right. So, no. so uh, right, right. There's no way to. So we have a different. Yeah, a different situation. Yeah. I mean, you get it. Right is there anywhere in Montana has only the wild? Like Idaho does. Oh, like in this wilderness is yeah, way. I got the way. Yeah. Yeah. The overall it says 141, 150 is on 70. Yeah. Or that's 150 is back in the good thing. It's also on the so Sarah highlighted a paragraph here, which um, from a kind of SDM perspective is maybe getting ahead a step or two in the decision process. Um, so I wanted to ask if folks would be comfortable Moving that to the parking lot for now, or if we want to find a way to repair this. It's actually set. You kind of go back to the age clause. Yeah, as worded, this is more of an action than a problem. Or so. Yeah, it Any pieces we should take from here? You like you like the multi dimension, the multi faceted, or we'll say park problem, something like that. I think it's important overall. There's yeah. not nothing we can do anything about really. Yeah, that's the really important topic. Our future. Well, another future. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Yeah, 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 and that's yeah, legit, but that's not focused on even doing anything about. So, 
Anything else from this one? I think we bought the points. Yeah, you're just going to do something about it. I mean, yeah, I agree on that. Well, it doesn't depend. That film is not necessarily, it's not a representation of the population. You know, like, it could be really good. It could be great snow. But you can't prove it. It's not. You know what I mean? Like, so that great point, but. Dude, what do you do with it? You know, like, what well, do we want to pluck it out of there? We could at least drop it in the parking lot and put it somewhere because it seems like a, something to put you on. Is it this one? That we're I do. I, do. I, I mean, I don't think it's bad. The next one down. The next one down. I just, no, it, it, there's going to be areas that, okay, that's the case, but there's going to be areas that mm -hmm. isn't the case. But at the same time, for, in the end, if we're talking about quotas, I do think it's a valid point because, I mean, like anywhere you we film every year before it's you know early, but then at the same time, we run all year yeah. and don't fill quotas. So that's a classic deal. But we know there's yeah. cats there because right. of access limitations. The, the proof is will yeah. be in the pudding. So if you see 314 closed out in a matter of days, right. yeah. the day we, we filled that quota in 16 days. I know I'm repeating myself. My 13-year-old son did that. We killed 40% of the quota off of a 10,000 acre ranch. That area goes for 50 months. Right. There were four more cats to run sure. that day. 100%. They were running two north and south of us. Yeah. We have a book on cat problem. Right. That and kid. Don't miss God, kids and stuff. Hey, exactly that, right? But if it stays open, and the only question, I guess, this is philosophically where I don't get this. So, in the areas where you don't fill quotas and they have more cats, we haven't really done anything because no. you weren't filling them before. So, there's no harm done. You don't have to change the way you do it. And if you weren't filling it before, what's the problem? You know, if they add it, you don't have to do it. But you're done, like our quotas, we have three in our, in our area. And they, they're filled most of every year. Okay. I mean, it's not like we're filling every year, but we don't even fill. No, it's not like that. Yeah. It'll be a random year where one, like three years in a row, we had quotas around us that didn't fill by like one top. I'm going to say so, something, and I don't want yeah. to be talking here. But I, I come from a trapper perspective, but if hound hunters, and I am a hound hunter, and I love hound hunting, and I don't want to kill all lions, but if hound hunters have the same thing I have as a wolf trapper, where I have to dispatch that wolf on site, those quotas were filled in every unit almost immediately because the amount of cats were pushed up trees. There's one kid south of a tree, 20 some cats, never killed one. Well, then they're going right in your quota close. Well, because they're chasing them up trees, they let them go, they drive away, they go tree another. That's not a representation of an accurate population as either. If we have a mandatory, you chase the cat up a tree, we're going to get rid of cats, and you had to kill everyone, these quotas would be full. Be put more on the people put them up trees. Yeah. 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 I I get what you're saying. And I'm not proposing that. I don't want anybody to that. Okay, I'm just saying you yeah, can't I tell can. me that if, if they didn't have that mandatory, I have it on wolves. I cannot, if I have a 60 pound wolf in a yeah. trap, yeah. I cannot release that animal. I have to kill it. Yeah. We don't talk yeah. about population dynamics, we don't talk about any yeah. of that. If yeah. you put that on mountain lines tomorrow, these quotas will be full. You need to carry a collar on me. <laughs> so, shall we take a look at group yeah. three? Sure. Group three. Depends if you like it, Gus. A line of three. That was from before, I think it's not included in this one, so we're just looking at this. Oh. We can't go from that. <clears throat> um. oh. 
a person, but it's not what we're trying to do, right? But right. Say what we're doing, like that's the definition of what we're Yes, doing. we're, we're, we're you know, not embedding new laws, we're not changing the new and, and I think in the end, that's what everybody's in agreement about is that, hey, listen, yeah, we're trying to follow through. We're not changing laws, we're not doing that shit. We're, no. You know what I've heard overall that I agree with from the family is like, I don't know this gentleman's area. I wouldn't preclude to be an expert. He's saying that he needs it left where it's at, and I will do that. And down in our country, we do have a lot of lines. And I think that it needs to be flexible enough where your local biologist is actually out of their truck for one and working intimately and flexibility. And certain areas you're going to target them, certain areas you're not. And specifically in key wintering regions, you know, I think one of the reasons we go so fast is everything from the northern herd comes up in winters in those areas. And we know that because we're killing cats that are coming out of the Lamar Valley. Huge. I mean, they cover huge areas. Did they be the first thing that you said? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, I think the, I mean, it's why we're here, right? right? Like, like, I think. That's the crux of it. Yes, exactly. But in, in nobody's in disagreement with that. It's just you know, right. there's a lot of disagreement. In the I think it gets over. Yes, right. I think that's what gets over. Um, top end of this paragraph. I'm not sure where to put it. I think with this paragraph, did you say it more the, or was that you see that we're trying to make, uh, what is that, fourth line? Starting from there, just, uh, we're trying to make a decision with very one tool. And we're trying to do that. I mean, that's, that's a true statement. We all know that. We're just trying to. Yeah. Isn't that, that just, yeah. Isn't that, that a parking lot statement? Yeah. Like quite a bit of that. Remember, still parking lot? Down to we want help. You know, we, down to the last sentence of the paragraph. I think there's my opinion. I think that's all parking lot. All related. I also think it's a conclusion though that says you're justifying the means to your end, right? That you are. You don't have all the tools to make good decisions. So based on the information that we're given, this is the best we can come up with. Like. I don't think we're not to, we're not gonna fix it, you know what I mean? That's not but those disclaimers, if you want to call them that, mm -hmm. I think are important that says, hey, listen, is, know, is that like, supposed to be in there? So I remember reading this. One piece of the time like Johnny Cash said, we're looking yeah. at what we're trying to do here. Yeah, yeah. I know it's totally yeah. out. Like I don't think it's a statement like, okay, we can't do anything about it. I get that, but at the same time, it's it's really what's handcuffed. You know, on the example of the sheep, it talks about stuff what kind of like that. So maybe, maybe that should be left there as a kind of a disclaimer. So from in my opinion, yeah, yeah. from an SDM perspective, those could be considered constraints on a yeah. decision. Um, so I think there's it would be valid to leave them in. Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong. Under constraint. Uh, yeah, you, you, you don't have to. You don't have to drag it all day and name it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I think just because we can't do anything about it doesn't mean it's not part of the problem. So it's definitely part of the problem. It is part of the problem. There, I, yeah. And so when at the end of this we have the final report and the other members of the public read it, they'll understand better okay. the whole context of the challenges you as a community face with making these recommendations and everything that went into it. So sure. having that in there is helpful yeah. to help people so really understand that. Yeah. So we don't need to make it. I, I was just thinking okay. that probably making it really precise or I mean that's obviously a legitimate concern and a legitimate thing. Does it need to be there? Is it supposed to be constraints or I don't yeah, know. I think I don't understand. The yeah, we don't have to label everything as trigger, um, okay. you know, scope or whatever. So I think it's fine to just okay. have it in, in the narrative. But it does explain it, and it does explain our maybe reluctance or struggle to make some of these decisions. So. Yeah. Sure. Let me go back to group threes and see if there are other things you want to move over.
I think it's same with everybody else. I got yeah. probably there. Wow. Group four. Or you took this piece. So. Decision makers, I mean, that's that's the fate. I think we need to have the decision listed for this type of model. I think that is fitting. Um, anything from the trigger that's new? Of these pieces down here. Just now, to the combine them. One thing that I heard this morning that I maybe it's in here that I'm missing it, but I'm not sure was. Um, Folks brought up that there are different groups of the public that might have different interests that can be intention. That came up from you guys earlier. I don't know if you were reflected in this problem statement or not. So I'll just I'll just mention that because I had a note about it from the morning. Yeah. As far as education side of that, is it not education, but I think someone said, you know, there's folks that want more lion hunting opportunity, there's folks that want more ungulate hunting opportunity. And so besides just balancing the population, there's a balancing of people's interests and demands. It's kind of got here from some people, isn't it? Like, Except what we don't have represented here very well is just the global hiker um, is a picnicker that wants to be a lion. <laughs> <laughs> it's not not here to do So we're not getting the whole picture. Most of those people don't want to get lions. Right. Do they, <laughs> do they, do they want? Do, do they want? Do they want, want, want lions to be part of their life? You know, or their that's other thing. Outdoor. They're not buying. I mean, like, I mean, they're overall they got to buy it. They, they got to buy it. They got to buy it. Yeah. Buy it. They, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. The ranching community would be the one that I I feel like. Look, and I'll just go. I actually read it in one of the studies where. They didn't have access to private ground, and there's sometimes there's a reason for that. These guys are upset. You go down to Paradise Valley, I can list them off for you. Well, here's Mike Stories, right down to Hubbard's. We're talking fifth generation people. They want lions dead, right down to the go ask. Me. We have, we did right before I had, we came up. All right, asked to be on this committee. We did the poll there, and there was no dissension. There's equal, equal opposite to that, too. There is. And there is. How to where they don't want you on your property or on building cast. Um, or they want to kill everything and put up a tree. Uh, I had one lady rancher friend of mine ask me on my season man, And I said, great. Got quite a few. She said, I hope you kill them all. I said, why? She said, well, just one dead. I said, why would they do to you? Uh, nothing. You know, so it, that's my whole thing about education. education that's been yeah. crazy out there, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm not beyond taking cats here and there and here and there, here and there but uh, it is, it, it's like it's cat percentage. They have a lot of cattle issue, cattle not mine encounters down there. Oh, there's cattle. I mean, like, even my neighbor, my next one, neighbor, so my wife killed the cool. Is that what I'm asking why they all want to keep going? No, I mean, so I'll give you a specific example. Rock Creek, four years ago, I know my wife put some boat out. It was a 90 pound tom for the record, but it killed her dog and had it buried in the creek bottom 100 yards from the house. And you can talk to the game warden down there. Now, that's where class and age structure has no bearing, guys. That's what we're eating lion. They have kids coming into that. Here we go. I mean, all those, all those little things all about that. 
Mm -hmm. um, that female that I closed the quota out with three years ago, she killed three bighorn sheep that week. I don't care about age class structure there. I'm protecting those sheep. That's that's what I've been tasked to do. So when the season's open and I've got a calf that's targeting, and they do, they get very specific like this. I know everybody in this room, the biologists included, have seen this. They get certain animals get. When I was a federal trapper, I did, a OCD. I did not have to kill every coyote. I had to kill the coyote that was killing the sheep. The, coyote, the killing didn't stop until you got that coyote or that wolf. You don't have to kill everyone. I agree with what you're saying. There's some that don't ever do any harm. Honestly, the, the cats and riders, a specific deal, it's the two and three and four year old toms do more damage to livestock and everything than any of those old toms do. Those old toms provide a lot of stability, if you will. They kill out the other stuff. You can actually do more from a predation management, taking those 120 pound toms out than you ever could have done underneath. I was just curious if, like, as to the ranches of, you know, you see a little bit of your ranching mentality. <laughs> you know, but I didn't know. But, but is it like a wolf maybe? Like, okay, you're at a pretty good encounter with a cow, with a cow yeah. and they come in and investigate. You know what I mean? Is there there's no data on that or anything like that. It's just it's just more of the ranching from John. Ranching mentality where right, right. you take coverage and that's just their outfit for deer and stuff. Right. You know, the deer right. are they took so, like weeks in their season more. Like, absolutely. We're still yeah. having a three weeks season down there. We're, we're just trying to we're kind of charging using yeah data here now that we're provided versus what the hunters. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where's the data? That's exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> that data. Right? Yeah. The only data I've got is the closing season, so you can do it. <laughs> so, so, go ahead, I guess. So, as you're talking, I'm thinking about what we're hearing about. I think we can better specify all the different stakeholders and people that have different interests in, uh, in this problem. So, some of this about the livestock owners, pet safety. Um, what are the other stakeholders you would like to well, add? Just general. General public people that are out hiking and camping, right? They never buy a tag on the hunt or anything like that. Yeah, they're just, just I, I don't, but, but they do. Yeah. So that's important to capture that as far as different viewpoints. The ranchers were in. Oh, well. Should I change the ranchers? Uh, lion hunters. Lion uh, hunters. I don't know. So one thing I would suggest is um, possibly moving this. We want healthy cat populations up here towards, you know, describing the overall context of the problem, because I think everything right above that is kind of getting to the challenges, as is this next thing right below the highlighted text, right? So it's trying to help. We can format this however you like. Just a couple quick thoughts I can. Right now it's 2.05. We're scheduled for a break at 2.30. So what I'll suggest is that we all read through this again, and make sure nothing's missing. Make sure that everything we want in there is in there. And then after the break, let's come back and wordsmith and arrange it. But for now, let's focus on have we captured everything we want to capture in this? So take another moment to read it and tell us what's not in there. Can we go back to group one? Back to group one. It's been a while since we've seen their statements. We can go back to group one, sure.
Is there a multi-dimensional problem to a better job of describing them? I think that's what didn't we steal that statement? Oh, that was that the same one. I think that's yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, Multifaceted is a better word, or no? I don't know. Whatever you guys <laughs> In the PR, yeah. <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> Rebecca, can you stop? Welcome to the inevitable word for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just got one. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'd love to add something in there that. It's like gives a nod to the ecosystem services provided by the mountain lions themselves as an important, if not absolutely vital part of the natural systems at play. Because I worry that in tending to our desire to be really conscious of following that state law statement, that we can friend a little bit more into the like shoot a cat state and elk mentality, which I'd like to avoid because it's vital to have predators on the landscape. Uh, as I stated earlier, mountain lions don't seem to get CWD, which will be moving forward very important for helping to maintain healthy deer and elk populations so that our hunting opportunities don't go down the toilet. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge some of that in this statement. Just take a stab at some words. Yeah. <clears throat> So when you say they don't get CWD, yeah, they don't pass it on either. No, it's mainly, I brought a paper along. I would really like. Yeah, to. I've got a few references on that. It's new information to me. So my boss dug it up because I thought it was absolutely fascinating. So he's been reading up on it. But yeah, it looks like the buck stops with them. So cats, if they kill a CWD animal and they eat it, they don't pass it on. If they scavenge dead CWD animal, they don't pass it on. It just stops with them. So they can do a really good job of cleaning that up. We really like to see that. Yeah, so it's brought along and you know, prior to the industry and disruptive, and we live in the soil for time. Oh, I know that it's like the craziest thing, but yeah, apparently they uh, definitely pass through. They don't, they don't get it. Yeah, yeah they get all the things, sure, they catch all sorts of other little things, but apparently not that. So that could be really um, important. And let them live. Yeah. Well, you need them out there. You need them out there for lots of reasons. Yeah, like they're really important to have out there doing their job, and they have a right to their own prey base, mm -hmm. right? Like they, they don't they don't eat that stuff. They don't live, so we want them out there. We have to accept we're going to keep steering out. Yeah. I was just going to get everybody's thoughts of the rambling. So. We're not going to look at this again for six years. I didn't see him out there. So anywhere in here, do we want to, probably not, but you know, the the landscape has changed tremendously in the last six years. We want to try to address that a little bit or just leave it as far as land ownership. Lots of, uh, loss of you know, all these housing developments. Uh, the ag industry, you know, there's just people just buying everything and not having a cow to put you back on. And I've known a couple of them, it's pretty crazy amount of money was rolling out there. But that might be sort of different. How's that for now? What are the challenges? <laughs> no, that's went really fast the last few years. Yeah. What else is missing? Right around million and if the answer is nothing, then we'll take a break. Let's put out there something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>
non consumption users. Let's take a 15 minute break. We'll come back at let's come back at 2 30, we'll be 18 minutes, and then we'll we'll spend this to perfection. Man, oh, we're we're
So, last section of the day. Everyone's doing great. Really appreciate you guys. Um, during the break, Sarah and I just changed one or two commas and periods here and there just to get the grammar looking good. Just to be Frankenstein this thing. Uh, but yeah, for the next little while, we're just going to wordsmith this until it looks just the way everybody wants it. Um, and then if we uh, we can, we'll move on to the next part on objectives. So uh, the easiest way is to just go through it sentence by sentence and see if, if we're happy with each one and if there's anything we want to change. So let's start with sentence number one. I mean, just like the letter we're giving the committee type of thing, or what? What like what is the format of this? This is just the uh, the top end of the final report that this group will have. Um, we will be able to put together after this process that shows everything that goes into this. The problem and uh, that he wants to do. Is that like standard format? What you want to no, see or anything like that? Is, or is... Yeah, that's a good question. And like I did do a little bit of like removing some headers and uh, rearranging just a little bit to put kind of like thoughts and like. So this is more the typical format of a problem statement now. Okay. Is this uh, going to carry over to the October meetings? Yes, and so we can always come back to this and revisit as much as we need if we think that there's more to change. Yes. And just have a quick question for the group on the uh, second paragraph where it says animals that don't migrate. I'm assuming you're referencing big game animals. Yeah, it might be more spider guy that some folks don't think they're potentially talking about lions don't migrate or whatever. But is that is that what you're talking about? Is big game animals that don't migrate? Ungulates. Yes. Ungulates. Ungulates. Um, my migration. <laughs> <laughs> One sentence down, so you're happy with the first sentence. Yep. Great. We'll just let you read and pipe up if you see anything you have a question about or would like to change. And for what it's worth, we have every previous iteration saved in this overall document. We'll share this with you at the end of tomorrow. Um, we can send it out by email, however, and you can still go back and see how this is shaped over the course of these two days. So nothing's ever been lost. Wherever everyone's going at their own pace. Yes. Yeah. Right. We're not just doing like people sentence one, two, three. Right. Uh, you yeah. know, yeah. I was going to do that, but it feels a little awkward. So we'll just all read it. If you see a change, yeah. type it in. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get rid of the block tool. Mm -hmm. No, we decided to that we parking lot that or something. We could parking lot that. If that one does stick out to me as a little bit. Um, Sorry, we were sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Is everybody agreeing? Like, like, all yeah, kinds of that. It was, yeah. Yeah, take that. That's the parking lot. Oh, yeah, I think we're going to be good.
We paint irrigated pipettes to forage. Like just type forage and still that? Or, yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah. Available forage. How's that? Then I'll cover the grasses and stuff on the. Uh, whenever they do a clear cut and make some grass. Can we can we change so be the top paragraph there if you just back in seven for after the drop we need data that's very uncertain, true data, and models that do not agree with what we as hunters have observed in the field. I'd like to add to the simple words is that uh, some of those models agree with what we see, some of them don't. All right, like the models show to um uh LV two fifty is a ton of lions and it does. So if we change it like all models um, and models that do not always agree with what we saw. Just a simple thing not change. Everyone a hunter it says we as hunters need non hunters. Picnic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pickers and reserve. We as hunters and Say mission will be influenced or should be influenced by our committee's recommendation. Should be. My should shit out. Yeah. I, 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 just, I think they should be. I think will is a bold will. <laughs> I hope they will be influenced. Just say what I feel like it's they will make a decision make them feel guilty if they're not fired. But will they make a citizen decision? How do we feel about this? The problem statement. We put that A, that don't make sense. Or fish wildlife. We'll make a, a decision on the upcoming season. Wouldn't that be better? Yeah. 
right. some crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Before you watch the whole game, three and four. Consider this committee's recommendation. How about we put maybe influence design? Right, would be another one we'll consider. Mm -hmm. We'll consider being influenced. We'll consider. <laughs> 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 There we go. Are the groups okay with that? Or, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So, how does this all reach you right now? Is there a reason that the parenthetical reference to the CWD mitigation was removed from the lines? Keep it We just meant to keep it broad, but if you'd like it in there, we can put it back in. Yeah, yeah. I'd like it. It's all right. I think it's kind of a little important to consider. <laughs> Has that been vetted though? I mean, are there multiple documents that prove that lions kill the prions carried CWD? Here are three papers and a little sound. Like you don't read this. <laughs> I have to speak up here. I, have to, I agree that I'm not disputing that they don't get CWD, but in order for the lions or the predators, large carnivores, to control CWD in a population, the selection for infected adults have to be three times the selection for young, which is unrealistic. That's way, way more selectivity for infected animals than have been observed. Say that again. So they talked about Colorado population where they like to be to improve the vulgar population with all of that stuff. Yeah, they do select for CWD positive deer, yeah. but their selection ratio for CWD positive adults needs to be three times their selection for juvenile in order to see CWD declines in population. And that's an unrealistically high level of selection okay. compared to what we've seen. And if it does occur, it's going to be accompanied by declines in unrealistic populations of 50 to 75 percent. Which are going to be unacceptable in many cases. So I'm not disputing that lions are important for their own right, but I do think it's important to qualify the degree to which we expect them anyway to host the CWD, because I don't think that totally is. I'm not saying they're going to be like a total bullet for it, but in the state of like advocating for lions for existence for their own state, the fact that they contribute positively to the United States. My hope would be that that would like be something that might benefit of uh, their uh, right. being allowed to say leave it out. Yeah, and I'm not disputing anything about the the value of knowledge. It's just yeah, the, 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 the idea that they're going to help control CWD or large carnivores are. I'm not convinced about that. Yeah. I don't think they're going to be the sort of board on it, but I do think it's a unique. Thing that they can do that, and so it has, has they provide a lot of these sort of they eat like all sorts of stuff out there, they, they do a lot, of but that one, like just moving forward, is a cool study. So, I thought it's would, would this edit satisfy? It's the one Sarah came up with, uh, sure, yeah, are folks okay with that? We don't all have to agree with everything in this. We all have to no, feel don't. like everything here is capturing the overall uh, feelings of the group of what's important, why this is complex, and so on. Anything else from all the great discussion today that we're missing that comes to mind at this point? Folks are happy with this. We can get a head start on tomorrow. Get into objectives. Shall we do it? Need going once, going twice. Oh, we can come back to the it. whole thing. Or... Yeah, there's the part below it today. Okay. Yeah, and then the parking lot has the features we. Okay, the park, well, the parking lot we're not putting in. No, we can. We'll put that at some point. Bring about a half a page down. There's nothing else to have that. No. Oh.
down or up. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know my direction. <laughs> If the building is like we think there should be more. No, we're just don't want to. I just think it. it's this group seems to be pretty good at taking in complicated problem and simplifying it pretty well. I said, how many people do you want to do? I think this is a great. Place. If everyone here feels at this point right now, we can come back to this later this afternoon or tomorrow or whenever or not again, depending on how we feel about it. Um, if you feel good right now, we can move on and keep it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what the objective is. Right? Yeah, come back. <laughs> <laughs> Is that so good? Yeah, we didn't get that for yeah. like, we didn't get this far. No, yeah, okay. All right, <laughs> well, congratulations. That was really a nice amount of time to spend on the problem statement. And it, again, I think it looks great for where we're at right now. And yeah, it might be the final round, or maybe we'll get back to it some more. But we're going to dive into the next part for objectives, and so. This is where we get to really think about what we care about, and it helps to keep asking this question. If you could solve the problem perfectly, what would you be able to accomplish? So think about what does success here look like? And um, this is really important for this whole uh, SDM process because this will be how we evaluate and compare the different alternatives is based on the objectives that you develop. Um, and so it's important to make sure that we include pertinent information in our decision. So these objectives will do that, and it'll allow us to explain our decision to others. And one thing about objectives, too, is they have to be unambiguous. So we'll keep asking you questions to really um, find the unambiguous objectives at the end of the day. So the way we do this is to start thinking usually about different concerns and wishes, and we've been talking about that all day. So you already have a really good head start. And then we'll convert those concerns into objectives. And we'll ask you to dis distinguish between fundamental and means objectives. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But then we'll go through and review this for completeness. Again, this has to be a complete set of everything we care about here. OK, so thinking about converting concerns into objectives, you can state objectives as a verb and an object. So say you have a concern. Uh, maybe livestock brucellosis cases are a logistical and financial burden to livestock producers. Then a potential objective here could be to minimize brucellosis transmission risk from elk to livestock. These are just examples. It's not relevant necessarily to this problem at all, right? But um, here's another one. Hunters are adamantly opposed to test and slaughter of elk and other heavy-handed approaches to brucellosis risk management. So maybe then the Potential objective is to maximize acceptability of brucellosis risk management action actions to sports persons. Or FWP don't have enough money for this, minimize costs. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, we need to distinguish between two types of objectives that really often come up at this point. Fundamental objectives are where we want to go. So this is the bottom line, what we really care about. And it also is what success looks like. Means objectives is how we get there. And so uh, this is more of the methods we can use. So again, good decisions are based on fundamental objectives. And usually you'll come up with means objectives first because those are the things that generally come to mind. And we can keep drilling down to what is the bottom line? Why do we care about that to get to the actual fundamental objective? So a fundamental objective here would be minimize costs. A means to that might be to award elk hazing contracts to the cheapest contractors. Or a fundamental objective might be to maximize the available area of free public hunting access. The means to get there might be to enroll 10% more landowners in the block management program. So again, in order to separate these two, keep asking why over and over. Why do you care about that? And when the answer is just because, that is the fundamental objective. If there's another answer beyond that, that means that you need to keep asking why until you get to the just because. <clears throat> so 
some suggestions here might be to establish a line population trend that is acceptable for multiple user groups as one idea. Try to write out this as maximize or minimize. So um, instead, we want to say things like maximize acceptability of the line population. And multiple user groups here, we need to think about who all these people are so that we can have objectives that address what they care about um, and usually different objectives since in order to compare the different alternatives, we need to be able to evaluate how well each user group might be able to be satisfied by different, um, different alternatives. Okay, again, we're charged with these items, not charged with the season structure and license type and allocation of quotas. Um, so we'll go ahead and again, do the five minutes of just brainstorming. Does this make sense so far of what we're asking? Start telling us the things that you care about and what you hope to achieve. So what does success look like? If you could just start by jotting down some ideas, we can take a few minutes and then uh, circle back around the group and make sure we all understand kind of what this phase looks like. Questions? I can go back to any of these other slides too, if there's anything that you'd love to see again. Let's take about one more minute to wrap up and then we'll keep iterating this.
Anybody willing to share a few objectives? We don't have to hear from everybody, but love to hear from a few. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just jotted down to maintain a healthy, stable wine population, offer sustainable harvest and trophy opportunity. I uh, see more overcast, over and over population. Okay. Yeah, that's basically what I have to uh, healthy land population, age class, and increased fire opportunities. Uh, I have the same thing healthy lion population and a healthy, well, having a healthy, healthy population. Um, total opportunities for different species. Um, and how do we get their status quo using quotas and adjusted numbers as needed? Um, and then maximize under opportunities. Oops. I kind of had the same thing, but I put my thoughts were a consistent line population. That's you know, so that kind of means it's always there, you know, not overkilled one year and um, wiped off. Maybe you gotta wait, you know, for me five years is a long time, so I'll be done in five years. So that's <clears throat> basically echoing what they're bad said. Coming up with this new, new starting point. And you know, maybe that's saying some build stuff, some new stuff, whatever, but you have to have the ability to adjust. Like it can't just be a finite thing and this is how it is. You've got to be able to take into consideration all these other factors. What, what that process is, I don't know, is it legally, is it the commission? I don't know, but. There has to be an ability to adjust based on how the factors. Can you say a little more about that? Suggest the quotas. The best thing is it's not, so for just specifically talking mountain lions. All right, yeah, we want to maintain a healthy mountain lion population. Uh, we want all to have opportunities for you know, opportunities. Um, but at the same time, if that comes as a detriment of the populations, then we have to be able to adjust things. Like, this can't just be some set of stone number that gets thrown out there that, you know, is never looked at again. It's kind of like what we're doing here today. It's been done a certain way for a long, long time. But I also think that in today's changing landscape, it needs to be done more than every 30 years, too. So, every six years, with this same type of thing. Comes up and says, All right, we made some changes. How's it looking? What do we need to do? What do we need to adjust? Like, science is going to change. Nature's going to change. Like, there's too many things you have, can't account for with that. So, yeah, thank you. Folks want to add anything that we haven't heard yet? To manage lion densities to balance ungulate and lion populations. Generic the bottom line for me is I want to strike the balance. I don't want to hurt these guys' opportunities to hunt lions. But what I witnessed, I went to the Region 3 meeting. There was virtually no change in the quota from what it was even after we lost the cap. They just said the burden we lost them off the quota in that. We've got to strike that balance where when your locals are streaming or increases. Right now, that, that's the status quo. It's just the same thing every year, every year, every year. And we're not addressing loss of opportunity on some of these other things. And there are diverse lion hunters wanting three lions. I respect that. I like to chase lions myself. Having said that, when other things are hurting, that has to have to have flexibility to adjust. And that's what the, the rigid, the rigid structure before it was like, oh, tough shit, man. By having the different stakeholders um, listed out as different objectives to maximize satisfaction for them. maybe the people who like to tree lions and the livestock owners and so on, we can look at those different trade offs um, under the different alternatives. We'll consider it and see all that interplay. And Here would be a baseline parameter. This doesn't affect any of these guys. 313 specifically, they took away two weeks of our season. We've lost. 
over 3,000 tags in the last 20 years. They took away a sheep season. As long as that stuff is gone, we should probably be minimizing predators to the maximum effect until they give that stuff back. When you're taking away opportunities, by statute, you should be managing this stuff. That's all we're saying. So you've got to have the flexibility to do that. And it's not just happening. You talk to the boys on Northwest or these guys, if you're listening to what they're saying, you feel like opportunities being lost. That's the bottom line for me. Those guys want their two weeks of elk season back at 313. The opportunity is gone. If I remember right, though, isn't 313 border the park? So the Montana and FWP don't really have a whole lot to advantage because all of them migrate out of the park, you know, most of them. Or am I off of you? It's been a while since I've been there. So that 313, I mean, to be candid with, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, we could do this for the day. Let's get yeah, the rabbit hole short. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, the, the, the elk do come out of the park, but there's also residents north. Yeah. They they cut the last two weeks of the season because of the bull cow ratios and the calf recruitment and so forth. But we didn't do anything to increase our predator control. Are there factors at play beyond predators that are impacting? Absolutely, absolutely. And what can be done there also in those other areas? You know, I would love to have that as an objective up here too. But we'll, we only get to deal with farm lines today. That's that's where they've got to come in. What are the other? The kind of, I don't know that. Number either. one thing is wool. Okay. Number one thing is wolves. I mean, we agreed 15 breeding pairs. We were 10 times over objective. Number one, grizzly bears would be another minimal, you know, factor. Um, there's there's a plethora of issues there. The issues are all predators. It's just different no, predators. Not, it's, it's not. No, after the fires of 1988, 7,000 elk and Yellowstone started dead. Nothing to do with predators. That would be a thing. Yeah. And wasn't that two weeks cut off because of hunter safety? Because no. people catch him all on the flats there and shooting the hell. I went to every meeting and hunter safety. I don't remember that being brought up. I remember bull cow recruitment. I remember calf recruitment. Um, you know, it's we can really go down the rabbit hole, you know, but we could sit and watch videos of 30 bulls and two weeks later, they're all dead. These are the things, like parking lot type things we can they put are, in there. Right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You can't just talk about lions. They're not the real problem. They're part of the mm -hmm. actual holistic wildlife management approach. This is this is like one tiny issue in a broad, complex thing. Yeah. One lever that you as yes. can make a suggestion for and keeping all of this in your minds of the, the complexities that you're aware of. And that's why we're having a hard time directing that one little piece when we know about the whole thing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. with, with, with what we're asked for, we need to find a population uh, trend that's acceptable to multiple uses in the field, from hunters to big makers to you know, whoever. But I mean, to get there, don't you use the past and credit data that you have? Collected to date to get a state population trend and then go from there. I mean, isn't that isn't that isn't that what we have to work with? Don't we have to have something finite to work with? I think we we have the data that we have, and we know it's not perfect, and yet but it's the best data. Can somebody have. just say, okay? I know what you guys said that. Everything was really skewed and moved out, and we're supposed to take this information from the Northwest and, and apply it to this area. And we can't do that. Nobody's comfortable doing that. So we really don't have anything to work with right now as far as the population trend goes. Can we recommend increased monitoring? Is that a thing that? I think you can make additional recommendations, but I'm looking for <laughs> experts in the room to tell us if that is fine or not. It's like if we're concerned about the data and we would like more of it, or we'd like it to be a little clearer or whatever. And we also like we want to try to make better decisions on that. 
then could one of the means that we recommend be to increase the efforts to get that clarity? That's a great idea. Right. Justin, Brian, do you guys have to say about that? Yeah, I think you could recommend, you could, you could recommend increasing monitoring, uh, in, increase annual efforts from more areas, but I don't think it changes the fact that yeah, in that process, and you do not need an estimate of line population size in the eco region to set the season. I know that for a fact because it's been done that way since the early 70s. Right? So you, it can be done without that. And it is making decisions under uncertainties, that's the way it goes as far as trying to there's just a lot of uncertainty. So we can we can get more information with more monitoring, but I'm, ultimately I'm not sure how much easier it would make it to stay. So it's fine to recommend it. I just want just want to be real uh, It's not going to affect your if you recommend it, it might you might have more information next time. Skip years that committee might have more information. But you're not going to have more information, you know, in this certain process. And kind of the, another way of looking at things, um, when we started with the Northwest Eco Region, um, we had a population estimate. And when we talked to the folks that were in the room, most of them didn't believe our estimate. And so they were still uh, went through the effort to make up a uh, make a recommendation. And I, I think it's Oftentimes, you know, if we were to, to throw away our population estimate and everything, we'll say, how many lions do you guys think should be in the room? Would you would you be able to come up with a number? I mean, if we all did it independently. Um, what we're looking for with this effort is based on your sense, with your experience, with your your perception. Should there be fewer lions or should there be more lions? And is are there places within the eco region that should have more reductions or more increases than others? I mean, in a lot of ways, I think the expertise within the room probably have a better sense of the relative density. And so we're not really looking for a number. We want to know do we want to go up or down in size? And Cody, I mean, you were part of this when we did it the first time. We had estimates that you helped create even then. Was it any easier? The uncertainty is there, but I'm not sure that would be easier. Definitely if you critic. So Sarah, would you just cover, I think this is a really tricky distinction, this fundamental versus means. So before we break that into groups, will you just review that one more time, Grace? Yeah. So again, often when we start trying to list out objectives, what we start with are means objectives and those end up being more methods we could use to get to what we really care about. So as long as you can keep asking why and coming up with another answer, you haven't really found that fundamental objective. When it's the answer is just because that is what we care about, that's the bottom line, that is the fundamental objective, and those are the things you really want to identify now. Means objectives are good to list out too, um, as you you know think of them, because those can become good alternatives to consider later. But what we're after now are those fundamental objectives, the bottom line of what you really care about and what a solution to this problem would ideally look like. You could do it perfectly. And I would say to, to break that apart. So if you've got multiple groups that you're trying to maximize the opportunity or satisfaction of, you know, break those into multiple different objectives and that'll help us deal with that uncertainty later. Um, so we're going to break into groups now and again, work on a list of these. We're going to, uh, I'll, I'll give you guys a number so that we mix up the groups and then we'll go to our slots. Um, questions before we do that? Concerns? Comments? Great, so we've got one. Remember your number. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, 
four, one, two, three, four, and one. So the ones will be over here with Molly. The twos will be on this side of the table. Threes on this side of the table. And fours around the corner past the exit time. Yeah. 
So as we're getting set up here, uh, our plan next is to walk through these one at a time. Sarah and I will help point out the mistake, not mistake, but the thing that always happens with these is help you translate those means objectives into fundamental objectives where we see that. And then we can start making a map through list of, you know, what are our group objectives? Hopefully we can end the day with that. Um, so we're just working through the technology here. And once it's all copied over, we'll we'll just jump right into group one. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, we can step through these. So group one has a uh, balanced number of ungulates, and that looks like those are sub bullets, maximize hunter opportunity for ungulates, and manage for sustainable, healthy population of ungulates. Uh, how do we feel about those as fundamental objectives, Sarah? I think that's certainly that top one might be getting us something that's would be potential fundamental objective. Just one quick question. How do we maximize hunter opportunity for ungulates on a general tag area? Isn't that already maximized? All your neighbors are telling them to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just saying. 
Well, I think that's I think the idea behind that was we have more more animals on yeah, the more animals ground they need by that. Have a bigger opportunity as a success. What we're getting out of that is you've got your your sustainable populations, right? The right where you can use that. Where do you want to maintain those sustainable populations at on the low end of that, high end of that, more ground, that sort of thing? So it's not that yeah. all you need to come to home. It's where do we, how do you, how do you manage, you know, ultimately we're managing mountains to help manage hunger. Right. So where do you want to maintain those populations under unless at? Right. That, that's kind of what was hardly my main question at all. Whereas so those those levels are the ungulate populations are established by these guys, right? So we want to maintain, you want to maintain you know if they're established by those guys, there would be plenty of elk on the other side. So the objectives are really right. Objectives. Okay. Yes. okay. But that second one, manage for sustainable healthy population of ungulates. Yeah, we kind of threw out a few and then we changed them so like a step and a half. Mm -hmm. So that kind of sub bullet is in there, maximize sustainability of lion population. Okay. That's what we ultimately got to with that statement. Increased opportunity for lion harvest. And hot spots of ungulate concern. We were to ask why we want to do that. Well, they kind of, it's probably same, following the same idea as what they're doing now in a couple of them on one of the roller series, right? Yeah, you feel it more. Oh, is whoever wrote that, are they thinking similar to like what they're doing right now in some of the roller series and stuff? Or are you just thinking? If you have a sheep herd in there, you give out a couple extra from this. So that was the idea. Yeah. Coming up with uh, land and harvest that addresses the you know, focal point areas that maybe are below objective. Yeah, the increased opportunity for lion harvest and hot spots of ungulate concerns you may raise as a means because we want to do what of the ungulate populations, which is back to one of those first two blocks of this sustainable healthy population. So that is one of the things that we'll certainly, I'm sure, be talking about when we get to the alternative space. So, so for the next one, manage sex ratios of lion harvest to minimize disruption of social structure in any given territory as much as possible. It's another one where we can ask why. And the why points us toward the fundamental objective, which is maybe something like the one right below it, maximize sustainability of lion population. That's why we would want to manage those sex ratios that way. Um, so I think we've got some great fundamental objectives in here that we could pull out and um, maybe initiate a master list using a couple of these um, that we can then return to as a group and edit and add to or subtract from. So folks comfortable if we do that and just pull out some of these fundamental objectives, start a list. While, while Sarah does that, any uh, there's a parking lot item. I don't know if that group wants to share. They're thinking about that parking lot item just to loop us all in. It's just we brought up there's something we haven't really talked about has been brought up much is you know minimizing the impact to the public. Um, if, if it was a lion that wandered into town and yeah. caused the problem, it should it should go. It shouldn't really worry about you know, yeah. to, you know save that lion or whatever if it's causing problems that it needs to go. Should be counted with the rest of them, maximizing the population or minimizing the amount of, of disruption to the social class of the lion. The one that's really causing problems needs to go. 
Just maintain public safety as a more broad. Yeah, basically, there you go. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the uh, urban lion parking lot item, which is giving some good ideas. Great. So, yeah, let's pull some of those from group one to add to the master list. Uh, yeah, some of those ones from the bottom starting with maximize sustainability of lion population. And technical difficulties part of the day. We overcome. Okay. What are we thinking about this one too? Uh, and yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah. How about, um, what's your, what's your take on the bottom two ones there? Maximize trophy and maintain adjustable harvest over time. I think that the maximized trophy is something that will probably be coming into the conversation at the action step as one of the how many NPCs. It's my, my favorite right now. And then this is probably something that might be really an overall objective that you want to see done no matter what. Right. Um, so it's not something that needs to necessarily be in this list of things that we'll evaluate. Um, we could come back to that question. I'm sure. Um, back to maximize trophy or a class hiring opportunity. What what quantify a trophy? Where where how do you get to that? All land or trophy, you might as well. I mean, we don't like to kill what we want, but people that do kill the young juveniles, they think they're trophy. So how do you define trophy? That's a trophy, yeah. yeah. It's from the folks who wrote this one. Record class. How's that? Fair trophy? I think it's a isn't it? Yeah, isn't it defined as a trophy animal by definition? Doesn't matter. Isn't that how it's been defined? The line of the trophy. Well, no, if you go back to statute, they got trophy classification for deer, right. animal, elk, right. right. prize. But no, and the regs, they consider a trophy. So if you go to a trophy class and you want to do that, go to a trophy system, when I'm offered doing shoot big stuff, but you're going to wind up on a finite permit system because you can't kill a whole bunch of children on the wrong area. You know, so the, the higher opportunity goes down, I think, with trophy, trophy ID. I just add really quick if you're talking about language. So, um, when we manage for what we, what we have in our meal deer management plan for the special management areas, the language in there says we're managing for over age classes. Mm -hmm. That helps. If we just remove that word trophy, do folks feel comfortable with that? Just maximize older age class song hunter opportunity. So they'll make the non hunters happier. We heard in like a qualifier is where appropriate because there may be times where having those older individuals out on the land may be the better bet. 
think we would be even better served by making that its own objective, which is okay if it's in tension with this objective. Um, so if we could try to translate that qualification into an objective of its own, I think that'll work even better. So do you want to take a stab at that or preserve older age class individuals where it kind of fits the population or management objectives or deer and elk population? Or manage for an older age class life. There will be times where that is better than removing. Is that a means objective? So why do you want to do that? Why I want to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, because it will benefit the population stability and can be a benefit to your deer population. So those objectives are listed at the top and we can put maybe this one as a means objective of a way to get to sure. those fundamental objectives. I always tell people uh, finding the fundamental objectives is like arguing with a seven year old. You just keep asking you, why? 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 Yeah. No, that's a good sign. Don't yeah. get annoyed. That's a good sign. Those two are the same thing pretty much there. One is the ground, the other one is the ground, and there's probably better ways to word that. But if we don't have to finesse the means objectives too much, this is something we can play with as we get to the next step. Same lines and true lines. Same lines and true lines. Can we scroll to group two? Who's got healthy lion population? Higher age classes of lions. More hunting opportunities. Are those already covered in our yeah. list? Healthy ungulate population. How was that? No, yeah, that is in there. Okay. Uh, ample hunting opportunity. We've got that. Minimize conflict. I think that's a new one. Yeah. We move over. Can group two walk us through number four a little bit about minimizing conflict between hunting enthusiasts and ungulate yeah, hunting, hunting enthusiasts? The oh, lion hunting enthusiasts. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry, that's right. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your conversation around that one for group two? Is Troy Martin. I was trying. I remember putting that in there. <laughs> <laughs> What you all were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. She wrote it in yeah. there. <laughs> I think we were just talking about or some of those areas, right? Yeah, like we wanted more. I'm going to go over and better than something you guys are doing for a uh, chain out. Yeah, from perspective of what we're seeing where we're at, there, but then how do we manage that in the eco region perspective? But it was back to the So, when I, when I wrote that, it was based on the conversation you all were having about how you have a certain segment of people who want to have as many lions as possible for hunting, but then the same areas you have people who want to reduce the lions because they want to reduce my population. So, the conflict between that was what I was okay. So I think we'll be best served by two objectives that reflect the pieces of that. So maximizing hunting opportunity and maximizing, well, basically both kinds of hunting opportunities. Uh, so I think we will we'll absorb that tension into the discussion just by having those two objectives broken up. Uh, but yeah, that's an important dynamic to capture.
right? Should we take a look at group three? This looks like these objectives are, did you guys break them up as, as thinking from the perspective of these groups or walk us through your thought process here, group three? The basic, basic thought process is we need to find a uh, population trend that takes everyone from their city dwellers to our town and you know, everybody. And how do you get there? You have to have a start and you have to be a base trend. And you know, we're just concerned about being uh, having enough influence to really change thought process, I guess. But we're talking city dwellers, for instance, have a huge impact because most of us don't even realize what the impact they had on the world, for instance. I mean, we have rules because of non residents, basically. I mean, there's some people in Montana that for the most part, we didn't have anything to say about it as residents. And so, what I'm saying is, is the outside influences um, influence what happens with planet as well. So, we have to get that into consideration. We're just a little part of it. So, if we had a perfect solution, what would that look like? Uh, the solution would be everybody be smiling. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe we've got a few folks smiling in our objectives. So, maybe we need to add another group about the city dwellers that are missing this yeah. year. I think they maybe. Maybe they think they want more lines, but as soon as one shows up in their backyard, they don't. Know. Right, but you know, as a whole, I think people in New York think out oh, Montana, uh, wild place, right? Those city dwellers. It's, it's, yeah, it's this wild place that we want to make sure that there's there's a whole new Jersey new line. So we have to have this little park out here for them. So it, 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 it's a big deal. They have, they have a right to stay here. What do you think, Sarah? How do we translate that to objective speak? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, no is it something where, like, maximize satisfaction of general public? I guess our goal with that would be to say we've got all those different um, factors in there, all different groups. Where if you take them all and you average it all out, hopefully that would be the baseline. So. Also, one thing I will get to talk about is how important each objective is that we come up with. So they won't probably all have equal weight. And so yeah. some of these, you know, will allow that to, to vary and we see how that influences the decision and support as well. <clears throat> Or you guys have done the work for us, breaking right? the fundamental. So, healthy lion populations, maximizing hunter opportunity, uh, business outfitters. Can Group Four talk a little bit about that part of it? The business outfitters. <clears throat> oh, I just we're just going through reasons, the whys. Yeah. Why would you want to maximize hunter opportunity? And it came down to hobby, passion, profession. And, and how fitting is the profession that is directly related to lion and unknown species. We might want an objective that reflects <laughs> that part of it too. I think those others are captured. I don't know if you have to use the word maximize, but um, the couple should be in there. Opportunity or satisfaction, 
We could say maximize our better satisfaction with line for yeah, it's okay to use the word maximize, even though we don't want to just like, yeah, right. Yeah. Like it'll allow us to, it's just a kind of a decision analysis type thing that allows us to see which direction ideally we want to take. We don't want to kind of minimize it. So, if anything, make sure that it's, that it's maintained. Right. In a perfect world, we would maximize all these things, mm -hmm. right? I mean, all of us. Knowing that we're going to make the trade offs eventually, but right, this is the perfect moral language. You know, the, the word maximum in all the category kind of says one thing to me, and that's selfishness. You know, it's like, do really things have to be maximized? You know, <laughs> could it just be out there opportunity or out there opportunity? It's like, well, the bad news is it can't all be maximized, right? And that's where right. we get into the next stage of this, which is calculating these trade offs and weighting these objectives and deciding what can give and what can take. Uh, so, this is just to kind of set us up for that step. We definitely won't be maximizing anything, let alone everything. So, right. yeah. There is another way to say this, though. Like, for example, maximize hunter opportunity for ungulates could become maximize hunter satisfaction with ungulate opportunity or something. Like opportunity. So we're talking more about how people feel about it, not necessarily the opportunity itself. If it helps to think about alternative language. Record four. Um, the ungulate populations, recreation, business, and outfitters, uh, hunting is conservation. Can we hear more from group four about that last four point hunting is conservation? Just theoretically, hunters pay for the majority of conservation for fish, wildlife, and hunters, for a lot of revenues generated from hunters, license sales, you know, things of that sort. So, um, which shows population is so just a point, but it's you know, like it funds a whole lot of conservation for all of species. So it might tell us to maximize that. And because that, that's sort of a, again, that's a how, right? Rather than a why. Yeah. Well, I think along those lines is a, a goal should be to improve public support of lion hunting and or hound hunting. Honestly, I mean, I'd like to promote and improve the perception of hound hunting, lion hunting along the way. And contemplating whether there are things that this group would recommend that could help with that within the charges of the group, or if that's something that's like a parking lot idea, this is also something that we recommend. Definitely parking lot's fine. So the next one we've got is restoring what's been lost wherever un ungulate tag opportunity has been lost. Uh, increased line quotas to restore ungulate pops. Well, I think we've got that one kind of covered as a fundamental objective in terms of maximizing our ungulate opportunity. Uh, that one's definitely a, a means objective. How do we get there? Um, does that feel satisfactory to that group that we've got that covered? And then the last one here is the ability to proactively adjust quotas each year, biologists working with all stakeholders to address specific issues. Pass that again through this, the SARA filter. How does that check out to you as a fundamental objective? I think that one again might be something that is a good parking lot 
recommendation that will help with items in the future. I'm going to say we take a five minute stretch and coffee break. Yeah, maybe a cookie break. Got a good list.
So thanks again, everybody. We know this is a long day. That is because tomorrow's a shorter day. So we appreciate you hanging tough with us in the hard part of the afternoon. So what's going to happen the rest of the day is we want to review this list again, just like the problem statement. We want to get it as close as we can, but we can always return to it later in the process. But let's get it as close as we can now. And then we're going to start getting into the numbers. We're going to meet with each of you one on one and talk about what you'd like to see in terms of numbers in the eco region. And then we can share that information back with you tomorrow. So, first things first, let's take another look at this list. What are we, what are we missing? What, if anything, do we want to edit? Take a minute to scan this over and, and see what you think about those questions. Focusing especially on the fundamental objectives since the other areas are things we can keep going on later. What kind of broken down into two as far as sustainability of the population? And maxing color opportunity for lions. What about maximizing sustainability of our human population? I mean, if we're considering those two different aspects, if we change this word to maximize sustainable population, I'm just exactly what I did. Anything missing? Elephants in the room. Is this one about conflict? Are there different things you do for livestock depredations versus public safety? Like, do those need to be split out, or is in general in those situations you do same line and others like maybe be the, the tool that you would use to minimize conflict? I think the people something. Yeah, together. Okay. We can take another look when we're fresh in the morning. How about for today? We go once, twice. <laughs> Let's get on to the fun part. So, what's going to happen next? We're going to, uh, there's five of us, I think. We're going to meet with each of you one on one and walk through a little survey about um, your preference for how the mountain lion population can change in the eco region. So um, raise your hand if you need to leave early and we'll make sure to get you first. Okay, so we'll, you'll be in the first round. Uh, there's five of us, there's 13 of you. So a couple of you will be kind of hanging out for a little as we do five people at a time. So um, yeah, that are we ready? Yeah, we have a map up on the screen of this deeper region and for your reference. Um, so wow. if there's any questions about that, if you can go back and check that out, I can put this back up on the screen as much as you can. Or I have, are you asking specific numbers or just stable, not stable, increase, decrease, or do you want to know the number of we, lines we want to see in that eco region? We've got a bunch of questions we're going to walk through. Okay, walk through with you. Yeah, both. Okay. Why is it, I was just why is the zoo or not in that eco region? Is there a reason? Like, I was just who, who made up the map? It was based on the resource selection function habitat model, and that was all before the 2018 strategy was adopted. Jay, are you still around? 
She got out of the room. Okay, got it. So um, it was based on that habitat quality. Essentially, we were looking at um, probably similar habitat. Well, I wasn't involved in those early conversations, but we we're trying to look at contiguous habitat. Habitat is probably similar. And just remember to see the Missoula that's from the Missoula Special Management Area, which encompasses a big area all around Missoula. And so it's not just more part two or four, it's all that stuff more Yeah, that's the other thing. It was um, divided up on uh, unit boundaries, yeah. but with similar average habitat values. All right, we're going to come find you one at a time. Are they you? All right, somebody. Uh, would you go with it, Molly? I will. But I